Did that work? Yep. Yeah, I'm recording. It. Okay. That's okay. it. Yep. See, Good job. We, are, we already had, I, told, I warned you we had a hiccup. So it was an we just had one. And every time we go through this process, I think I know Zoom and Carolyn assures me that I have no idea how to do this. And things happen. I just had to let Bobby, there's a special button you have to click for Bobby to record the session. So uh, yes, it will be recorded. Yes, it will be uploaded uh, to a link on YouTube and we will get it to all of you. So if you choose to replay any of it, you can. So anyway, you have the latest curriculum. I'll send later this afternoon or tomorrow, I'll send everybody a link for the next training session. So you'll have that. And I'll try not to send too many at one time so nobody gets confused about which thing to get. Um, today, we're going to do geology and soils. I'm going to go ahead and handle geology. On your previous schedule, one of our training committee members, Lisa Tuck, was going to give geology for us as a first attempt, and she teaches geology also uh, for Lee College and the TDC uh, inmate program. She got tied up, so I'm going to fill in for I've done geology in the past, and that's sort of my background in our sciences, so hopefully uh, you'll find it entertaining enough, and even more entertaining is that John Ferguson will be doing soils. Um, if any of you had a chance to look at the textbook and look at the soil section, I find it uh, about like watching paint dry. It's pretty stale. It's pretty uh, specific in terms of what the message is trying to convey. John Ferguson, for all of you Woodland residents in Montgomery County or listeners to the Garden Line on the weekends, is the owner and uh, expert on soils with nature's way. So I think that I've seen him give a presentation. I think you'll enjoy what he has to say a lot. So hang on and let's get the geology started. Let's see. Let's see, I'm gonna share my screen. First, I need to make sure that everybody can tell me they can see the slides. Yes, I can see the slides. Uh, yeah. Let me make sure. Is it in slide mode for me, Bobby? Well, it's it's where I'm seeing the whole PowerPoint with uh, the yeah, there we go. How it went there to presentation is. Mode. is that better? Yep, you got it. All right. Here we go. Uh, as with anything, in most of these presentations I've been in, there's always a group of people that are real geologists. I was not. I was in a, a certain specific brand of earth science in the oil and gas industry. So I have a background in geology, but I wasn't a trained practicing geologist. That being said, there's a whole lot of good stuff that you're gonna see today, and hopefully we can make it entertaining. And for those of you that have never been exposed to geology, this might be a little bit of an overview. If you've had any geology uh, in college, this is going to have components of it that are you probably see in the first freshman year, geology one, geology two. 80% of the slides that you're going to see come specifically from the guy that wrote the chapter in your textbook. Uh, the guy that wrote the chapter is a guy named Dr. Chris Mathewson. Chris Mathewson was an engineering geologist at Texas A&M. I sent him an email actually the year after I was an intern and said, do you have any slides I could borrow? Cause I think I'm gonna give a geology presentation for our master naturalist chapter. And he immediately sent me a memory stick that had 265 slides on it. So for those of you that would like to have that, I'll be glad to share it with you. Uh, he has since passed away, but it, he had a ton of information. He's an extremely good presenter and I've been with him on a field trip, but he relates everything about the science of geology really to engineering applications. So what would you do, for instance, at Jones Forest along creek beds to prevent erosion? Or, you know, why do levees get built in Corpus Christi at a certain place? And that was sort of his thing. So geology, by definition, on the first slide, the scientific study, the origin, history, and structure of the earth. But it's a little bit bigger than that. So we're going to talk about some of these. And no, you don't have to memorize all these words. Some of you have seen them. Some of you have not, cryosphere, biosphere, hydrosphere. Here's another way to look at it. So as an earth science, geology sort of fits one specific segment of all those different earth sciences. So 
if you look at the biosphere, the lithosphere, atmosphere, hydrosphere, there's a lot of discussions. And in fact, you're going to see lots of presentations along your training journey that include this. My question as a intern back in the day and later on is, so how do you relate geology for master naturalists? Because most of the people that I know in the chapter, they like ornithology or they like birding or they like uh, native, native plant stuff. Not everybody likes geology. <clears throat> if you do have the time to go to an annual conference, every once in a while, you'll see somebody set up a table, they'll have fossils, they'll have all kinds of stuff sitting around. But it's not really a conservation discussion per se, but it can be. And you're gonna see a little bit later how it can be. And I, you know, I tried to sort of take Dr. Matthewson's presentation and start molding it along the way so it would have some connection to our world, some connection to our chapter. And what we go through, for instance, uh, I think I've told you previously at the last meeting, I do a lot of work up at Lake Livingston. So how does geology affect Lake Livingston? Well, it certainly does. So we'll talk a little bit about that. So here's a start on your journey to Geology 101. I think some of you have been to this place. I have never had the good fortune to be there. So here you see some mesas in Monument Valley in Northern Arizona and Utah. It shows up in every cowboy movie that I've ever seen that was filmed out in the West with Hollywood. And so you look at that and you go, wow, that's really neat. I'd really like to see that. Well, you're a visitor. So you look at it for the scenery and the landscape and the vision. So what does a geologist see? So geologists might look at that and go, well, that's funny. I see sort of a base on each of those towers that look out there in the distance. I see a lot of dirt, but it also looks like I see stuff in the middle that's all the same color, and I see a little thing that's white across the top. Could they be related? If you look left or right, it could be that you could correlate between each of these and come up with questions more than answers. A geologist might see that and go, oh, those are in Monument Valley, those are pieces of rock that are more resistant than the rocks that were around it. So they held up longer to the weather, they didn't erode. And 10 million years ago, the landscape looked like the middle column. Let me make sure the mouse works here. So the middle column here, you know, while I do this, I'm gonna see if I can pull up the chat room. I've lost the chat room, so maybe I'll get Carolyn to help me pull it up again so I can see questions as they go along. So as we, as, where's the chat room? Zoom problem, hang on. <laughs> Todd, you may have to leave the full screen view to get your presentation and the chat on the same screen. Do I? Because we don't no. leave the full screen view, do we? No, that's all right. I'll just have, y'all can tell me if a question comes up. Yes, I will tell you yeah, if a question comes up. If, if something significant comes yeah, up. But yeah. otherwise, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll if, interject. Yeah, yeah, Carolyn will interrupt me. Or in fact, quite honestly, I know that we've said for everybody to mute their microphones and if 38 people jumped in, we'd have a problem. If you see something that's really concerning, just go ahead and unmute and sort of interject. How about that? And we'll give it a try. All right, so here we go. Let's go back to our train of thought. We got some stuff that's real resistant. 10 million years ago, it was all buried before it started eroding. And 190 million years ago, it might have had this dinosaur running around. So let's look at this one. So here's sort of a question. If I had done a poll, which I did not, I would have this as a question. Look at this slide and tell me what you all see. And you can go ahead and put it in the chat room or you can vocalize that. So take a look at it, it's obviously a fossil. It's obviously a fossil that's not of a Tyrannosaurus rex. It's not a big dinosaur. It looks like a leaf, doesn't it? Collected on the beach of Lake Erie in New York State. So one of the concepts that I like to throw out to the group is that geology is a forensic science. So we're going to be like crime scene investigators for everyone that's watched the show. A forensic science means you're gonna go back and look for clues to the past. So if I look at that leaf, I can look at this and say, hey, that looks a lot like a leaf that I recently saw. Well, it turns out this is not something you're going to see around here. It's something you're going to see at the bottom right. 
And so this is from my guy, Brazil. I've actually been there. So what's the big implication of that? You collected a rock that's a fossil that's at Lake Erie, New York State, and it only grows in a tropical climate. It doesn't grow in New York State in the snow. So you as a new geologist is now a forensic scientist and you can start making deductions and conclusions about things that you see and how they relate to the past. The clues to the past is sort of a key concept here. What are these? I think everybody on this Zoom can see that this is a dinosaur track. Texas has lots and lots of dinosaur tracks. Uh, I've seen many up in the hill country. And when we get to the point and talk a little bit about what Texas looked like in the past, I can assure you that Texas had lots of dinosaurs and was also covered by salt water from most of its history. And you're gonna see what that looks like. So that's another, that's part of what we call historical geology and looking back at uh, how things were in the past over hundreds of millions of years ago. If you look at this slide, the Grand Canyon, I think many of you might've been there. I had the privilege of going there uh, several times and actually took my family backpacking there when the kids were sort of high school to middle school age. The biggest disappointment to me about the Grand Canyon is that if you go stand on the edge and look out, it looks exactly like this picture. It looks like a painting. It looks like a photograph. It's so massive and so big, it's hard to comprehend. Interestingly, uh, if you talk about clues to the past, this is also a display of the Earth's history from about 3 billion years ago, all the way from the bottom of that river, all the way to the top. It's a, it's a record, it's a rock record of the past. And so it's used by many universities, uh, by many geologists to take a look and analyze what happened in the past. How'd that canyon get here? Over millions of years, this land rose and this river cut downward. And so everything you see has been done by the Colorado River at the bottom. <clears throat> Geology is not just about rocks. Uh, I had the pleasure and privilege to go to LSU, which uh, as, as everyone knows in Louisiana, there's probably not a rock for about a million miles. They do lots of study on river systems and river processes. And so if you look at the Mississippi River, the watershed, the drainage from the Continental Divide all the way across the United States, all these tributaries and fluvial systems is what we call them. That's geology. Uh, what happens to these rivers, how they migrate, how they flood, uh, what's the sediment load and what, the, the, what do they do? Why is the Mississippi River so interesting? Well, look at the coast of Louisiana. Uh, if you look at it, all of this coast along the southern part of Louisiana was formed by the Mississippi River and by this delta migrating back and forth over hundreds of thousands of years. The current delta actually extends out into deep water. It's called a bird's foot delta. This delta extends that way because the Corps of Engineers over its history has successfully levied and dammed up the Mississippi River. And so the sediments that usually go out here and migrate usually in a southwest direction down toward the Texas coast, uh, they're, they basically get dumped in deep water. And so if this delta doesn't migrate, then you can't replenish all the soil and Louisiana is losing acres and football fields of shoreline every day, every day to the point that if you add climate change into the discussion, rising sea levels and uh, no replenishment of sediment that keeps all these wetlands and marshes healthy, uh, the land goes away. I used to live when I first got out of school in Belchase, which is back up the river in South Louisiana, south of New Orleans in this area. My house was literally nine foot below sea level. And you could drive down the highway, down Belchase Highway, and see ships in the Mississippi River sail above your head. And it's pretty neat, actually. This is what the Delta did over the last 100,000 years. It migrated back and forth. So it used to be over here. Here you see one that built all the Chaffla Basin to the west. Uh, here you see different iterations. So the river migrated back and forth. Can you let it migrate today? It would might not be a good idea. Why would it be a, not a good idea? Because the port of New Orleans, which is like the second largest port in the United States for shipping, it would go away. If this river changed course and migrated over here, which it almost did in 1980 when I first uh, was over, sorry, 1980. Uh, 1977 uh, is the year that the river almost migrated by itself into the Atchafalaya River, you would make New Orleans no longer a seaport. 
it would silt up in the river from here down to the end of the delta would silt up with sediment and you couldn't navigate it anymore. That story in 1977 starts up here. If you look at the top left-hand part of the slide, this is called the Old River Complex. It's a place that was mechanically made by men a long time ago to let barge traffic go from the Mississippi River into the Chefla River as a way to ship goods. Today, 30% of the flow can actually go into the Chefla River at this point. In 1977, they had a flood to, uh, that you wouldn't believe greater than most floods that they have even today. And there was so much water pouring through a structure that protects the water from going into this, at this old river uh, complex. It developed scour holes several hundred feet deep that were on both sides of the structure. They went down, I forgot, two or 300 feet. They almost connected at the bottom. And if they had, the structure would have collapsed and this river would have completely migrated into the Chafla Basin and you would have a new delta forming at the southern end of the Chafla Basin. And so that almost happened. Uh, to relieve pressure on this river today, there's two spillways, the Morganza floodway, which is right here. And there's one down here, the Bonnie Carey, which is right down north of New Orleans. When this allows gates to be opened up to drain water here into the Chafla Basin and north into Lake Pontchartrain. So very fascinating fluvial sedimentary system. And if you have never been to the Chafla Basin, it's one of the richest resources, hunting, fishing, scenic areas in the United States. And so a lot of people are trying to do good things by keeping it preserved. Well, if all those river systems and fluvial geology is geology, just like all the rocks are geology, what is this? So if you remember in 1980, Mount St. Helens blew up. This is a volcano, and this is what happens when a volcano blows up. And look closely at left to right. Does this picture look sort of funny? It blew up here, it blew up here, and all of half of this mountain is gone. What was very unique about this volcano was unlike the ones that you see on TV today, is that it blew out sideways. This plume that came out of Mount St. Helens went up 80,000 feet and everything that you see up here is full of dirt, silt, volcanic ash, everything you can think of. So all that molten volcanic energy straight up and blew that mountain out sideways. It was quite an impressive thing to see in 1980. Lots of people went up and studied this. They had evacuations, they tried to clear everybody out, and still 57 people died. Some people would not leave. They were gonna wait and watch the volcano blow up. This is what the forest looked like adjacent to where that blew out sideways. 230 square miles of forest were flattened in an instant. So besides that 80,000 80, feet, and so if you haven't heard, airplanes can't fly through that and you can lose engine power and people have. Uh, trying to fly through plumes that are far away from a volcano. This ash got deposited in 11 states. The landslide that caused all this over here moved at 155 miles an hour. That's fast. And so if you remember all the sculptures and stuff that you see in Pompeii with people preserved for millennia that have been buried under all the pyroclastic flow, which is all the mix of volcanic ash and gases and molten rock, Moving at 675, 670 miles per hour, or moving even at the landslide at 155, you can't outrun it. So if you're close to it, you're toast. This is what it looked like afterwards. I think this picture on the bottom right was uh, taken in Billings, Montana, which is quite a long ways from Mount St. Helens. This gentleman was a USGS volcanologist that was at the site monitoring everything with uh, a lot of seismic stuff. He was never found again, he's gone. There's a ridge there named for him. And so he never outran it, it's probably instantaneous. And you can see what a road looks like after it gets buried by all that material that gets flowing down Mount St. Helens. All of that is geology, just like the river system, just like Monument Valley. So all of those things are part of what we're gonna talk about. So put on your forensic cap one more time and let's look at Stone Mountain, Georgia. What do you see? You're the visitor, you see it. And so for those of you that have been in Texas, this looks like Enchanted Rock, doesn't it? So this is gonna be a beautiful mountain that you like to sail around the lake, hike up to the top. 
What's a geologist see? He sees, that's not a mountain, that's a granite. It's a piece of granite, just like Enchanted Rock. We'll talk about granite in just a minute, rising above a nice Piedmont. So what that means is that granite is molten rock that forms underground, deep underground on the bottom right. And over millions of years, here, 300 million years ago, all this granite slowly, slowly cools. Nice is a type of metamorphic rock, so it's a different type of rock you're gonna learn about in a second. As this cools, it gets really hard and it gets big, big crystals and it's very hard resistant rock. And as the landscape eroded around the top of this, back to the left-hand side, you get that granite dome that comes out the top with the land around it. And it sits embedded on top of this other metamorphic rock. 10 million years from now, what will it look like? It'll be gone. It'll be eroded away. And that's another process that's going to lead us into the discussion with John Ferguson on soils. Soils come from erosion and weathering of rock and the landscape around us. And weathering is in a process that you're all going to appreciate because you're going to end up with the nice soil that we care so much about for all of our master naturalist discussion. River flooding, remember this? Uh, just think of Hurricane Harvey, if nothing else. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about the process of flooding and what it means to us as a chapter, and even in Montgomery County and Walker County. So Houston's down in the 60, 65 foot range in terms of elevation. I'm living north, sort of close to Huntsville now. I'm at 350 feet. Well, the house I was living in in West Houston went through this. And then hurricanes, we can't forget hurricanes, climate discussion, weather discussion, uh, but all the processes that come from a hurricane end up being processes that affect our coastline, affect geology, affect the way our coastlines look. Uh, this top left-hand slide was not my neighborhood, but I assure you my neighborhood looked just like this, uh, lived right below the Attics and Barker Dam and all this water came within about three houses of me. Uh, I saw my neighbors down at the end of the street where the water came out to the bottom of a stop sign and refrigerators in their house floated up and landed on their counters. And so I didn't know if refrigerators could float till after this, but all of these things that happen, all of these processes, they leave effects on us. They leave effects on our community. They leave effects on the wildlife. Uh, Buffalo Bayou that's next to me, which is a gorgeous, lovely place to hike and run and see every single day. Uh, went under about 45 feet. It went up 45 feet. That's all I can tell you. So why study geology? This is a slide right from Dr. Matthewson. So remember, he's an engineering geologist. So he's not a volcanologist. And he's not a sedimentologist. He's not one of those many branches of geology that is in a specific area. He cares about engineering geology. So I have a lot. It's in Montgomery County. It's got a lot of pasture land. I've got some ponds down in the middle and I'm gonna develop it. I'm gonna go ahead and build houses on there and send it to somebody. So I have two choices. I can divide this property into three lots and I'm gonna put my septic system down below each of these houses. Well, what about the guy in the middle? I'm gonna sell these $200,000 each and I'm gonna put his septic system right in the middle of all that nice pond where all those egrets and herons like to hang out and frogs and everything else. Doesn't sound like a good idea. Or he could divide this into two lots and he could still in a responsible way manage his septic system and he could preserve all this habitat in the middle and do a better, better more intelligent way to develop and be a good conservationist. So. I think maybe the master naturalist guy on the right hand side would have a better plan. San Antonio, also geology. I think everybody on this call probably has been to San Antonio, enjoyed the river walk and the San Antonio River going down the middle. Why is it there? And was that the original river? Nope. 1915, 1921, that river flooded. And just like any river that can flood, and every river, the Brazos, the San Jacinto, the Mississippi, you name it, Trinity River, they all flood. You have a house on the edge, it will flood someday, somehow. Same thing happened in San Antonio and the city with engineering geologists built a tunnel that's 24 foot in diameter, three mils long, and they diverted most of that water under the city, but they left a channel running through the middle that they manage. And that's how the river wall got formed. Of interest to all of us and me, uh, when I was living in West Houston before I moved is that 
the city of Houston, the state of Texas had a chance to build a tunnel just like this under Katy Freeway when Katy Freeway got rebuilt completely. They were going to do the same thing. They were going to take uh, large pipelines and put below the freeway cheaply before construction of that freeway. And they were going to connect it to the Attucks and Barker Reservoir. And when all that stuff flooded during Hurricane Harvey, they could have diverted under the city of Houston all the way to the ship channel. And none of that flooding would have happened. All the billions of dollars of damage that happened in Houston because of Hurricane Harvey would have never happened if they would have invested something like, I forgot how much, it was like $60 million. Something they said, oh, it's too expensive. We're not going to do it. And the result was billions of dollars of damage because people couldn't see their tax dollars being spent for something that would never be used, even though we got 45 inches of rain. All right, it's nine o'clock. So I'm going to get on a roll and we're going to go through a lot of this fast so that we can get to um, where we need to be time-wise and not just get you trapped in all of the geology. In your textbook, for those of you that had time to see it, it covers a lot of stuff that you may be interested in, you may not, but all of the things you see, time and geologic history, plate tectonics, basic types of rocks, and then processes, big, big emphasis on the last one. This is the part that I think will have most connection to our master naturalist discussion. But all of these principles lead up to a geologic process. You sort of got to know the other stuff to get from point A to point B down at the bottom. These are concepts that I assure you that no one's ever going to ask you again, but you have to learn it when you start school. Uniformitarianism, original horizontality, superposition, and cross-cutting. These mean, and these are concepts that we're going to sort of bring up in just a few minutes, like present is key to the past. Remember I told you you're a forensic scientists now you're going to look at things that we see in nature today and you're going to figure out well is that the key to the past if we see rocks lay down and we see bands in them so they're all looking flat and horizontal that's because everything you see when a river lays down bedding and bedding planes we always assume they get deposited horizontally and when you drive around the rocky mountains and you see things that are vertical they didn't start out that way they got pushed up into that way so over their processes cause change. Oldest units are always on the bottom and younger units cut older units. So what does that mean? We're gonna build a sandwich. All of you can build a sandwich. You put down your bread, meat, cheese, veggies, put bread on top, and I'm gonna cut that sandwich and I'm gonna stick a toothpick in it. So what if you didn't make the sandwich? What if you walked in and you found the sandwich just like that? And somebody said, okay, there's a sandwich sitting on the table. I'd like you to tell me how that was built. And you say, well, I can use those concepts and I can go bottom to top. The oldest is at the bottom, the youngest is at the top. So the last piece of bread got added last. Can you tell if you cut that sandwich before you put the toothpick in or the other way around? In geology, you get faced with those type of questions all the time. Well, what happened? Well, when did it happen? How did it happen? When did it happen first? Correlation. When we talk about correlating rock units, we're going to talk about if I have a mountain over here on the left and I'm looking at the mountain on the right, I wonder if they're connected. I wonder if they were at the same time and all this stuff like the Grand Canyon got eroded in the middle. You can tell by rock type a little bit. So all these yellow bricks are limestone and they could be connected to that. But how do we know if they're the same age? So we look at fossils that are embedded in the rock. And if these fossils look to be exactly like these fossils on the right, you can start making conclusions about whether these two things are the same. Let's talk about time. Time means different things to different people. To a geologist, it means a whole different thing. We think of things that are old by maybe looking at the top right picture. And if I'm right, that should be the Parthenon or something in Greece. So it's several thousand years old, beautiful structure, or it can be something as old as huge trees growing at the side of a wall. That's probably the Great Wall of China somewhere. Or it can be redwoods in California. So those are considered by all of us and me, that happened a really long time ago, not to a geologist. If you're a geologist and you go to university, they're gonna make you memorize this chart. The geologic time scale, Precambrian, Cambrian, we're not gonna go through all the names. Let's just tell you that you don't have to know them, but we use them in geology all the time. You're gonna use them as a master naturalist because you'll see in Texas has a rich, rich history in geology that covers a lot of this time period. 
So the geologic time scale is, says that the Earth is 4.6 billion years old. That's pretty old. So how do we get our head around how long that is? And I don't know about you, but thinking in terms of 10 years is a long time, right? Much less hundreds of millions of years of 4.6. Dr. Matthewson did his illustration of what things look like in terms of time uh, using a calendar. So we're gonna use a calendar. It's only gonna cover 4.6 billion years and we're gonna relate everything to January 1st to December 31st. So I thought, I thought Chris did a good job on this. So here, January 1st, the earth is born six and a half billion years ago. So we're really happy. When did the first signs of life show up? At the time that he made this slideshow, it was November 1st. November 1st was something like uh, 580 million years when a lot of microfossils were found that we thought that, oh, 580 million years ago. So across this length of a calendar year, equating that to 4.6 billion, 580 million was a long time. But since he made this slideshow, somebody found fossils that were 1.6 billion years old. So we've actually moved the calendar forward a little bit. November, let's see, December 7th, Pearl Harbor Day. At noon today, I saw the first mammal. All right, so there were micro fossils and there were fossils if the earth was really old and had a carbon dioxide atmosphere and life actually formed and released photosynthesis happened and released a lot of oxygen and created the atmosphere that we live in today. The first mammal after the dinosaurs happened December 7th. So it's been a pretty long year before we finally got to the first mammal. December 31st. So now we're back to sort of 2.6 million to 11,700 years ago. Man appeared 200,000 years ago. And so the last day of the year, the very, very last day at, let's see. So that's 11:17 p.m. on the last day, ice sheets. Remember there was an ice age and it formed the Great Lakes and all that kind of stuff, which is also historical geology. Here we are at the last minute plus eight seconds before striking midnight, the Bronze Age. Americans revolt at 58.3 seconds and then right at the end, modern man entered. So if you look, we haven't been on this earth a very long time compared to how old things are. And think back to the Grand Canyon and all those rocks at the bottom that are billions of years old, a lot has happened for us to get where we are today. So that's time in terms of a geologist perspective. Now let's move on to plate tectonics. What does that mean? If you've ever looked at the globe and wondered if all those continents look like they could fit together as a jigsaw puzzle, guess what they do? This has happened several times over the history of the planet. But this concept where everything was connected together in one continent and then eventually split apart is called plate tectonics and really wasn't discovered till sort of the mid 1960s. So it's a pretty uh, novel concept that's considered normal science in today's world. If you look at all these plates and why they do what they do, let's, uh, I'm not gonna go back, but all of, those con all of those continents that you see, the continental rock is lighter than the rock that we see in the ocean. So they actually float on top of that oceanic crust is what we call it. So you can see different boundaries between those plates. And if you go to the San Andreas Fault on the top example right here, that's an example of a transform boundary where two plates are sliding side by side. So they're moving, they're slipping next to each other. It creates a lot of stress. And every time that rock slips, it creates an earthquake. Now let's look at the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. This is an example where you have magma, molten rock in the Earth's crust that wells up in the center and it's building rock. And so this building and pushing out in either direction, it creates a ridge that runs down the center of the Atlantic Ocean. As it moves left and right, it's pushing the United States to the west and it's pushing Europe to the east. What happens when it runs into another boundary? It looks just like this, where you have a boundary where things are moving west and it collides with something on the other side. And at the top is Japan and everywhere this gets pushed down and all of this motion at the bottom creates earthquakes, volcanoes and all kinds of stuff. And so that concept is called plate tectonics. Interestingly, when you get all kinds of news that come in about they found a new dinosaur here, they found something in North Dakota, they found something in South America. A lot of the dinosaurs you see that were present in South America one time were also present in Africa, where they're also present down in Antarctica, which has fossils of tropical climate. So that means that landmass under the South Pole and Antarctica used to be much further north than it is, and it's migrated down there. 
and all of those fossils have been buried. If you also look at that jigsaw puzzle, we found that rocks that are present, say along the Appalachian Mountains are related directly to rocks that are related or, or that are over in Morocco and Algeria in that area. You find rocks in Greenland related to rocks in Norway. And so all those things are what geologists do. And the theory and concept of plate tectonics where these continents move away from each other in different directions and slit. Remember, this stuff's lighter than the stuff in underwater in the ocean, so it floats and moves. That's what happens. Here's an example of all these plate boundaries. They've been mapped extensively over the past decades. Uh, if you look sort of between the U.S. and all of the stuff in Asia, this purple stuff all the way around has also been commonly called the ring of fire, and it's known for having high incidence of earthquakes and lots of incidence of volcanoes. The northwestern part of the United States, if you didn't know, was built by volcanic activity and all of that stuff in Washington State and Oregon. It's all volcanic, it's all, which is where Mount St. Helens is. All right, so here's how, let's relate it back to us now. So we live in Texas. We don't care about all that stuff in all these other continents. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about Geomorphology, which is the study of the Earth's surface, one of my favorite subjects. And so surface means like sort of what you saw um, in the hill country. If you like the way the hill country looks, if you like the way East Texas looks in the Piney Woods, if you like the way that things look in uh, El Paso or down in Big Bend State Park in this area, that's the study of geomorphology or fluvial morphology, which is also one of my favorite subjects is how stream river channels and systems alter the land. This is a ge geologic map of Texas, and you're going to see this in several more slides, and we have a very, very rich geologic history, so it's a pretty exciting place if you want to look at stuff. Texas time travel. I told you previously that Texas has been underwater for much of its history, so let's see what Texas looked like starting at 570 million years ago. So this is the start of the Cambrian or Division Silurian dinosaurs are up here in member Jurassic Park. So you got Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous, all the dinosaurs are back up in here. Here's Texas and it's saltwater. Remember all these continents move around and they also flood and sea levels rise and drop. Granite rock outcroppings near Llano, Texas, the Franklin Mountains. Oh, let's go up uh, 100 million years. Now all of a sudden you see Texas under a whole lot of water and there's lots of limestone, dolomite shirt. We'll talk about that. First primitive land plants, corals are taking off. We're going to go start moving through time toward modern history. Texas still has a lot of underwater stuff. We have shale, sandstone, limestone. So all the shale and sandstone are from sedimentary processes like river systems cutting from the land down toward the sea, moving rock and sediments and dirt along Amphibians show up, golden age for development of fish. And we say, remember all those ferns, just like that one up at Lake Erie? Ferns are coming in to play. Oop, Texas is completely underwater by the Pennsylvania. So now we're up at 300 million years or so. So the Washita Mountains, which you sort of hear about up in Oklahoma, very old mountain range, everything's underwater. Reptiles make their first appearance. Oh, now we have a landmass that comes in. Paladuro State Park gets formed. Limestone reefs on El Capitan. Climatic shift, evaporitic flats in the panhandle produce shale, salt, and gypsum. So those are different types of minerals. The salt and gypsum, they get produced when you have a shallow sea and you have a lot of evaporation and all these things drop out of solution and form these crystals. But now all of a sudden we get the form of uh, Gulf of Mexico starts to open up, lots of land mass. This is going to split and become bigger. The Gulf of Mexico is actually underlain by a salt a formation called the Luan Salt. We'll talk about that later on. You get lots of uh, different events. The Rocky Mountains are forming up through here. Dinosaurs are running around. Dinosaurs flowering ants early, rodent like manual mammals. Sorry. Here's where the Rocky Mountains form up. It's called an or orogenic event. You don't need to know that, but it's sort of a mountain uh, making event that happened. So here's what Texas looked like all the way up to the Jurassic. Oh, we head to the Cretaceous. It goes underwater again. So the Hill Country limestone. I, I used to take my kids to Boy Scout camp up in the Hill Country. You can get limestone formations and get a little uh, pick or ax handle or anything you want and dig into this limestone and come out with tons and tons and tons of fossils. And so it's all really cool stuff. 
the dinosaur mass extinction that happened when a meteorite hit down in this area where Ron Blakely's name is, who we give credit on the slide. And it uh, was large enough to eject so much material in the atmosphere, it caused basically the earth to immediately cool, everything died off. So that meteorite impact and that uh, extinction event is what we call kill the dinosaurs because the climate change, because of all the dirt and mass that got put into the atmosphere and it took a long, long time for that to go away. And then the ice age, all the way at the top. See, we've gone from the bottom down here at 570 million years ago. We're getting close to the present. Men were around, right? Men were around during the ice ages. So they found people frozen in the ice over in Europe. All of this ice is really heavy, it extended all the way down into the northern United States, and that's how the Great Lakes were formed. So if you wonder where all that fresh water came from and how those lakes got carved out, that's where it came from. All right, so now you've taken a journey through Texas time. Uh, you've got some of the basic concepts. Now let's talk about rock types. We're going to introduce you to three different types. We're going to still go through this stuff quickly. Sedimentary, igneous, and metamorphic, your three main rock types. They get created at different stages through what we call the life cycle of a sediment, sedimentary rock. So if you get a rock, remember, let's say enchanted rock, and you weather it. So weathering is anything that affects rock that will degrade it. If you have ice, you have rain constantly hitting it, uh, cold and heat, sooner or later, any rock will erode. And as it erodes, river systems and fluvial systems and or wind transport it and deposit it somewhere else. And as it piles up in somewhere else, it becomes a sedimentary rock. If you take that rock and you bury it, whoop, you take that rock and push it underground, heat, temperature, and pressure compress it and make it into another type of rock we call metamorphic. If you bury it further and it melts because it's so deep in the earth and the temperatures goes up, it becomes an igneous rock. It can be igneous molten rock that gets completely melted and then it can start uplifting. Sorry, remember you can, it can start uplifting, it can change, uh, it can crystallize, it can be ejected like a volcano and we'll talk about that in a second. And then all of a sudden you're back to the weathering stage again. And weathering also makes soil, which is what John Ferguson is gonna to talk to us about. So you have chemical and physical weathering. We're not gonna cover much of that. Just remember that word because these three types of rocks get weathered and they eventually become soil. Sedimentary means to settle out. Different types of environments create different types of sedimentary rock. Here's the top left. You see all these boulders? You don't see that down in South Texas very much because all these rocks are Northwest of us or someplace else. It takes a lot of energy to move a rock. So imagine a really big flash flood moving all these rocks downstream. Sooner or later, they get degraded, eroded, and they get smaller and smaller and smaller. Or you can get into some of our lowlands that we have or wetlands in South Texas. Quite, we can consider the top left a high energy environment, the bottom right is a low energy environment. So we have lots of things, so very stale, slow moving water. They can carry high amounts of small particulate stuff. So silt, sand, clay, they're not gonna carry a boulder, but if you look at the Trinity River where I did a lot of my stuff, that water's very turbid, slow moving river relatively. It's got a very high sediment load. And as that stuff spreads out and goes close to a lot or a house and the slower the water gets, all those little clay particles and stuff settle out and they sit on your yard. So sedimentary rocks, highly prevalent. They cover 73% of the earth's surface but only 8% of the total volume of the crust. And so we're not gonna get into all that other stuff. If you go along a highway and you see some of this stuff like we call it sandstones, if it says sandstone, then that means it's got a high percentage of quartz. So we see all these, this is a little, what we call a thin section of a slice of this rock that we put under a microscope and we can identify the minerals in it. Sandstone is predominantly quartz, quartz is very strong stuff. It, it doesn't degrade as rapidly as some of the other materials that surround it, but they will get laid down as you have a water system that's carrying stuff in it. It'll lay down in horizontal beds and it'll they'll lap over each other. So we can see these things and we can say, ah, oh, that's a river system. And ah, oh, it came from this direction or that direction. You can look at rocks and you can tell what direction that they come from. You can tell the energy of the environment and the energy relates to what? What could live there? 
what is the current you know, journey back in time and you can project what was there a long time ago. If the rock gets really fine grained, it becomes and gets uh, composed of mud or clay materials, then it becomes something else. It becomes mudstone, saltstone, claystone. So this can either, in this case, this is defined by the size of the particles in the rock, or if it gets into clays, we can define the type of clay that's in the rock. Does Texas have those? So this is where Dr. Matthewson, hey John, um, hang on guys. Carolyn's right in there if you wanna go hang out. Okay. I'm rolling fast to get to you. <laughs> John Ferguson just showed up, so we're happy about that. So I'm gonna make sure I keep on schedule. All right, so one of the things that, that Chris did when he made the slideshow is to try to illustrate to you how the geology and the definitions that we've already started to cover are present in the world around us. So in Texas, all this Gulf Coast stuff that we get to see, sandstone and shale. All these river systems you're gonna see in a minute run sort of northwest to southeast. All the deposition for this is very prevalent everywhere. We see sandstone and shale everywhere. Remember, it covers a lot of the Earth's surface but Texas has a lot of other cool stuff. Limestone, also a sedimentary rock. Where does limestone come from? I told you it came from the hill country. And remember, Texas was covered by water for millions and millions and millions of years. With all those little marine organisms that are there make shells and they do stuff. And when they die, you have this constant rain of organism shells and stuff. It's called calcium carbonate, which is what limestone's made of. All these shells build up just like in the bottom left and the bottom right. And all these fossils can be seen under a microscope. And you can go down the highway and see these big formations. And so this isn't sand, this is limestone. If you, uh, they teach a geology student to take that and we'll get a little bit of diluted hydrochloric acid and we'll sprinkle a couple of drops on it and it'll fizz and it'll go, ah, that's limestone. And if it gets altered, altered a little bit through a little bit of chemical alteration and add some magnesium to it, it becomes another mineral that we call dolomite. Do we have any in Texas? You bet we do. There's limestone all up and down. And I told you just up in this area, just northwest of San Marcos, where there's a Boy Scout, used to be a Boy Scout camp before it flooded by the Blanco River. You can dig into little formations that are next to the road or where a road cut has gone through and you can see the formation exposed and you can find all kinds of marine fossils. So you, now you know how those marine fossils got so far away from the Gulf of Mexico because this used to be underwater a long time ago. Coal, we also have coal in Texas. And so what is coal? It's dead plant matter that gets degraded. It's primarily made of carbon and we get sort of low grade coal, not like up in West Virginia, but we get lignite that you can see in different parts of Texas. So once again, your geology map, you can see, wow, there's more to Texas than I really thought. Conglomerate evaporite, another type of sedimentary rock. These are like boulders on one hand, very cloudy, big chunky stuff. And on the other hand, evaporites can be minerals that are, uh, I think I mentioned before, you can have gypsum, salts and other things that form when you have a shallow sea and it evaporates and then a lot of these crystals fall out of solution. Guess what? We have conglomerates in Texas. All right, let's switch over to igneous rocks. So you, now you're an expert at sedimentary rocks. Igneous rocks, we always think of, oh, igneous, that's a volcano. Well, there's sort of two types of igneous rocks. There's extrusive, which means to push out of the earth. So think of Mount St. Helens and Pompeii. There's intrusive, things that sit underground like that granite that formed enchanted rock and make these big crystals. And you can see manifestations of this. Uh, think of Yellowstone Park and the geysers that we see and all the geothermal activity that goes on there. That's intrusive rocks from below ground. You just can't see them. Here's the intrusive rock sits for a long time. If this stuff sits for a long time, it allows all of these little minerals to come out of solution. They make really big crystals that are really nice looking. And if we were meeting face to face, I would have rocks that I could show you to show the size of these crystals. And it would be fun to look at because they're pretty. Intrusive, see all this modeling of color? This is a granite rock and it's got uh, plagioclase in it. It's got orthoclase, it's got different minerals. The pink stuff is orthoclase. The black ones are usually plagioclase. So these big crystals will form out. Well, what happens if you take this rock and you extrude it and kick it out of a volcano, just like what happened in Mount St. Helens? That stuff doesn't have time to form crystals, and so it cools instantly, and so you have very fine-grained stuff. 
uh, think of fine grain, let's uh, think of obsidian. Everybody's familiar with obsidian, right? So obsidian's very glassy. So it extruded out and instantly froze. And so you don't get these nice fine crystals that are fun to see. Granite, gabbro, diorite, just different names of different intrusive igneous rocks where the crystals get really big. Guess what? We have some. Everybody knows where this is. That's enchanted rock. I've taken my kids up there when they were little to climb up on the dome and it's nice and fun. It looks just like that example of that mountain we showed at the start of this presentation. If you extrude this stuff out, then you get rocks like rhyolite, andesite, basalt. Remember, I warned you, you wouldn't see those nice pretty crystals. It looks very fine grained, so it's harder to figure out what it is. Or you can get this one, like in this basalt, you get little, this is where all little air bubbles were formed and trapped by the molten rock and then escaped. Guess what? We have drusive igneous rocks in Texas and you can find them over here. You can find them over here, I think. Big Bend country is where you see the most. Metamorphic, I told you you could take all these rocks and push them underground and they could be smushed, compressed, heated and smashed together. And so here's sedimentary rocks, here's igneous rocks, temperature pressure, put it all together and you get things like quartzite. If you wanna think of metamorphic rock, think of marble, think of uh, your countertop, something that's really hard and really sturdy, right? So temperature and pressure. I've been to quarries in Colorado where you took a bunch of limestone and you smushed it all together and it became a metamorphic rock like quartzite. And then you can quarry it out and put it on the Washington Monument or other such places. Slate, another type of metamorphic rock here. Slate's just really flat, it's highly compressed. It's very hard stuff. Here's your marble. Once again, the same thing. So we're not going to go through that other than to tell you that once again, Texas has metamorphic rocks. So we have a little bit of everything. I think we're very blessed with that. Remember, uh, if you go next door to Louisiana and you try to show a map of Louisiana that looks like this, not going to happen. So we have a lot of different geologic regimes, a lot of different types of rocks, a lot of type of geologic processes that have gone on over the millennia. So now we're back to geology and processes. And how do you start linking that to climate? Over the course of your intern training, you're going to hear lots of discussions on what's uh, good to plant in our area, what are the temperate zones, uh, how cold does it get, what's the type of soil. Well, we all know in general, so remember you got the, uh, let's go back, so you got your geologic map, remember this one, so keep that in mind as we go through this. <clears throat> We all know that West Texas is really dry. So we go west to east, it gets a lot more rainy. And so we get a lot of rain over here in Southeast Texas. So uh, are we gonna talk about climatology today? No, you're gonna hear a lot about that when we get into the climate presentation coming up in a, in a week or so. We also have moisture regions and you know that Texas covers the gamut from uh, semi-arid arid to semi-arid uh, all the way to the really moist. I think I live in humid all the time, at least at my house. We also know this affects everything that we have. So we have the geology affecting things. We have precipitation and climate affecting things. It affects weathering. Remember, we talked about weathering at different parts of Texas. And we're in all the green part that's over here. And we're rich, rich, rich in all this green area of river systems and different depositional processes that occur all across uh, Southeast Texas. And then Texas topography, we talked a little bit about that, about how low Houston is relative as we get up to our level. But we have a little bit of topography here. No, it's not the Rocky Mountain stuff, but we all know if you go to the Davis Mountains and we go to Big Bend, there's lots of really cool mesas and all kinds of stuff. And then the High Plains is beautiful in its own way. And then we have landform regions and we're by definition at the Texas coastal plain. So, one of the things that we talk about, especially in Master Naturalist training, if you look at how other chapters do stuff, is we try to describe things that happen in our own eco-region. So we're in this eco-region, you're going to get a really good education from eco-region and what it means in the state of Texas and in our area coming up at the next training session. I'm going to skip the rock cycle and let's do a little bit of weathering. What can weather? Freeze and thaws, we get some of that here. We get vegetation, it grows into stuff and the roots break everything up. Animals dig around in the soil. Then we can have lots of mechanical weathering and that includes any river system that's in our Montgomery Walker County area. Erosion mechanisms, 
flowing water. We know that water can erode, change, and move stuff. We know that, remember, Texas is not just all land. So we have a great, great uh, seacoast, coastal island um, system that we get, we're going to take a look at in just a minute. And all those waves make changes to the Texas coast, and they do it constantly, which is why they keep trying to bring sand in and build up sand beaches for everybody to have a good time at the, at the beach. Wind causes stuff, it goes in Texas, just like it does everywhere else, and then people do it. Bulldozers, development, all you gotta do, I think you're gonna see presentations along the way about changes in the Montgomery County area, especially in the woodlands where we're removing things around and changing the landscape. Those are processes. They're all considered erosion mechanisms. So keep that in mind. It can cause problems. So geology means, remember, the guy that did this presentation was an engineering geologist. So he gets called out when he sees roads that have big holes in it. He's like, erosion, how did that happen? What type of rock was it? How hard was the rock? Where's the water? Did this flood? Did it collapse? Did it subside? Subsidence is a huge problem uh, in this area. So that's something that we need to be cognizant of. And it's all related to geology. Exposed pipelines, you don't want that to happen. Failed erosion of a control structure where it broke. These are all geologic processes. And so man thinks they can control everything and sometimes mother nature decides differently. Uh, we talked about deposition. Deposition happens. And once again, your geologic process discussion, at some point we're gonna talk about, <clears throat> um, we're, we're gonna talk about wetlands. We're gonna talk about how water gets captured between different systems. And if you get up into a mountain system where there's water, it moves downhill real fast. It creates different river systems that we see evidence of, whether it's uh, north of us or south of us. And so it forms different geo geomorphological features. So alluvial fans are a feature of braided streams, meandering streams. You see lots of this, for instance, in the San Jacinto River, which is close and right in the middle of our area. Fluvial stream, some definitions. Once again, this is geomorphology 101. You would walk out as a new geologist and say, oh, what kind of stream is this? Well, it's not just a pretty stream, it's a braided stream. So you have different types of uh, little rivulets and waters that run back and forth. So it's not just one big river, it's what we call a braided stream. That looks like a meandering stream. There's no bayou that you don't see in South Texas that doesn't look a lot like this. And these get formed by different uh, processes once again. What of all these uh, fluvial systems mean to us? It can be a transportation barrier. So we build bridges across transportation barriers or it can be a political boundary. If you're in Kansas, are you in Kansas City, Kansas or Kansas City, Oklahoma? Or sorry, Kansas City, Missouri, what am I saying? Political boundaries. It can be a transportation route, which is obviously used or it can be, uh, you can call that a natural resource. It can also be a destructive resource. Here's what happens when you get water combined as a destructive resource, when you get flooding, when you get hurricanes, when you, it can move, it can move all kinds of materials in places you don't want it to go. It can look like uh, this poor guy that's gonna have to redo his house and it can happen over and over and over if you build things in the wrong place, develop in the wrong place. So as an engineering geologist, you might give a developer some advice to not build in a floodplain to not build, for instance, they allowed development in Houston on the west side of the Attucks and Barker Reservoir and people developed in an area that was intentionally designed to be a flood pool. And guess what? The pool flooded and everybody that built in there got flooded and that's the way it's going to be forever. Meandering rivers. This is a very common phenomenon that we see and we see it all across uh, the southern United States in the area that I grew up in. Moderate gradient, when you say moderate gradient, it's not like a Rocky Mountain stream that's got fast moving water. And that means that it can carry a lot of sediment, usually has a single channel and a large floodplain. So floodplain can look like this. And so when you get away from that meandering river, you, you as a new geomorphologist can look at this and go, ah, that's a really pretty swamp, but it's also got lots of very quiet water. The previous was higher energy. This is considered lower energy. This can have a lot of standing still water and it deposits things really slow. Sooner or later, this type of environment can become cold. So you've already related that back to a different rock type and a different situation that you know is gonna happen. 
What happens when you have a meandering river that looks like this? Sooner or later, that river is going to flood. And when it gets and water flows on, flows on the outside of this, on the inside, the water is slower. That's when, if you have a lot of sand coming, you'll have sandbars that build up along the inside of this. We call these point bars. And if you're an oil and gas geologist, you'll drill for these because that's where a lot of the oil will sit. This can flood. This two can connect together. When it connects together, it looks like this and the river takes a new channel. And that other channel gets completely abandoned. That water gets very still. And sooner or later, it plugs up. And this right here is what it, you end up with. It's called an oxbow lake. Very common. Uh, you see them all over the place. And Eventually, it gets sealed off from the river. A lot of the sediment drops out. It fills up with what we call a clay. Oh, that's and there will be an old lake sitting around the other side. Aeolian sands, wind deposited sand. This happens in Texas. You think of Great Sand Dunes National Monument, Southeast Colorado. These no boulders, you get lots of fine grained sand, very resistant material. The wind builds it up and it's very, very consistent. So, Aeolian is a term for wind blown material. Delta has, you're familiar with that. We're not going to keep going over that. We're at 934, so I'm going to wrap this up in about 10 minutes. Here you have lots of uh, slow, slow, slow moving water that has lots of different channel directions and it drops all the sediment that's in the river drops out and it gets deposited. Remember that Mississippi River Delta, if that was a lot, the Texas coast gets a lot of its sediment from the Mississippi River and that all that sediment flows northeast to southwest. So it flows along the coast down all the way down toward the toward Brownsville. The less sediment if that gets deposited not in the deep water but can be put along the shoreline would help keep Louisiana's coast built up and would help us keep our barrier islands healthy healthy. So another couple of features that you'll see in Texas we have carbonates. So we talked about carbonate rocks like limestones, gypsums, <clears throat> that type of stuff. We have that, and just to let you know, we also have a rich resource in what we call barrier islands. I'm gonna skip this just in the instance of time, because I'm gonna show you another slide just in a second that shows you why we value these barrier islands so much. Uh, we have lots of wetlands. We are losing wetlands at a huge rate. 50% of the nation wetlands have been lost in the last 200 years. In the last week, I saw a presentation where the Upper Trinity River Water District is using natural wetlands to help filter water. Uh, you'll see this in all of your water conversations and presentations we're gonna have in the upcoming weeks. Wetlands are highly valuable as not only an environmental resource, but they, uh, they reduce pollution, they improve water quality. And if you keep bulldozing over all this stuff, you're gonna be in real trouble. And we have a history of putting ourselves in real trouble. In Louisiana's three million, 3 million acres of wetlands, 75 square kilometers are lost every year. Uh, if you have not seen any articles on this, they are already doing climate change evacuations in the very south part of Louisiana. So they're, they're already removing communities and moving them north away from the coast because the land keeps subsiding and because sea level is rising. We have things, see all these green dots? Remember, I think I mentioned early in the presentation that the Gulf of Mexico is underlain at the bottom by a salt. Remember, just think of a salt flat. Uh, the salt is called the Luan salt, and as, the, as all the sediment gets pushed out by the river systems and put in the Gulf and keeps building our land up, this salt is plastic, and it gets pushed up, and it pushed up into a salt dome. And these salt domes are mined for salt, or they can be used to explore oil gets trapped up next to the impermeable salt and we drill for it. All of these green dots are salt domes present in the Gulf of Mexico. Once again, that's an evaporite. It's an evaporite that formed a long time ago and through geologic processes got squeezed up and sometimes you get to see where they are around our area. I talked about barrier islands. Barrier islands are really good things in terms of environment, ecology, and protection. You can also have an erosional coast. We like barrier islands like this. Why are they important? These barrier islands get formed up from that sediment that gets pushed out of all the river systems in Louisiana that migrate down along our coast. They build up along the coast and behind them you get lagoons that form with very still water. 
Matagorda Island, which, uh, Island, Santa, <clears throat> which uh, many of you have been to, and think of the Aransas National Wildlife Refuge, a place of ultimate important beauty and preservation. And so this is a barrier island. It's very still water behind it. What's in that refuge? Stuff like this. So these are things that we want to see preserved. And if all these barrier islands get eroded away, all of this goes away. What can happen to a barrier island? Shoreline erosion. What happens when a hurricane hits us, which happens very commonly, you get lots of force, lots of wind, saltwater flooding that goes in and intrudes all this stuff. Uh, they're already having problems. I think I saw it in South Carolina, North Carolina, where they're getting a lot of saltwater intrusion. I think it's South Carolina. And they're having development of what they call ghost forest. So they have saltwater intrusion. You get saltwater getting into the water systems underground poisoning the uh, roots of the trees, and then they have these dead forests all along the coast. We're lucky that we have a lot of these systems that have developed over many millions of years. So we have transitional systems, and I think all of us like to go fishing up in this kind of stuff from Galveston all the way down the coast. Offshore storm, storms do great damage. So consider these geologic processes. So man built these roads, put up all this stuff, built these beach houses. <coughs> If you have a beach house, it's not a matter of if you're going to get flooded, it's when you're going to get flooded or how long your house is going to go. This happens. Uh, this happened. I don't remember if this is uh, the causeway in Lake Pontchartrain. Yeah, I think it is. But it, one of those hurricanes, Katrina did stuff like this. This is what hurricanes can do. So we think we have control over the earth and the geologic processes and all the climatic conditions these things happen and they can happen at great cost. Land subsidence is something that Houston has fought for, fought with forever. There's a neighborhood in East Houston that's close to where Exxon used to have a refinery. Uh, they built a neighborhood, I think it's called Brownwood, which is now a nature preserve in Baytown. And there's a hill in that preserve that has a marker on it <clears throat> that I've been to once. And it shows the original location of, um, the neighborhood and Exxon proceed, Exxon Mobil proceeded to pump out like 25 million gallons of water from the aquifer under that neighborhood per day for the refinery. And this happened not too long ago. So you can look that up and you'll see the Chronicle articles on it. And all it took was a couple of hurricanes and that neighborhood went completely underwater, completely subsided. You can see remnants of streets and swimming pools in that place. And it's now a nature preserve next to the ship channel subsidence is real. And so Harris County and the regional water districts around the Houston area are moving away from pumping out groundwaters to reduce this problem with subsidence. And then we're gonna go to groundwater. So where does your groundwater come from? It comes from Lake Livingston, Lake Houston, Lake Conroe. That's where your water source is gonna be. And if the area keeps continuing to grow, you're going to need more water and where are you going to get it if you keep pumping it up out of aquifers they'll eventually just go away and that's being managed real well there's a lot of work to to reduce this and make it better shoreline erosion we have to deal with here's hurricane ike i remember that well this is the bolivar peninsula if you had a house on bolivar peninsula you weren't this guy that built this thing out of uh, titanium as far as i can tell so he was the only guy that survived but it's sooner or later that's a geologic process that, remember, you're a forensic scientist now, so you can go back in time and you can see what things look like millions of years ago. If you all of a sudden, geology is two things. It can be a very, very slow process. So think of the magma chamber and forming those crystals over hundreds of millions of years, or it can be an instantaneous thing. Think of Hurricane Ike, and all of a sudden you've moved mountains of sediment and materials in one week. Think of Mount St. Helens, and we showed you that example. That was a catastrophic event that happened in a couple of days, right? So geology is all of those things. It's very slow to very fast moving. And so you as a new forensic scientist can go back and try to deduce what happened. Uh, here's a, just a picture of Harris County. And one of the things you'll hear as we get in our water discussions is development all around the Harris County metro area. And if you concrete over all this and start running all this water into the sewer system, sooner or later things flood. So <clears throat> I'm gonna postpone that discussion until we get a little further along. So now we're back into watershed. And the only point here, remember we talked about those maps. 
geology map looks a bit similar to the precipitation map, looks a bit similar to aquifers. It's now 9.43, so I'm gonna get, line this up in two minutes, only to point out that we're gonna have discussions in the next few weeks that include river systems. Notice they all sort of trend northwest to southeast and all that water flows down to the coast and all those geologic processes that you're now an expert in, you now can understand what's going on with these things from way up here to way down there. I can tell you I have a, a lake house that's up on the northern end of the of Lake Livingston, which is on the Trinity River. All I have to do is go up to Dallas-Fort Worth and see how much rainfall they get. And if they flood there about 10 days later, it's going to flood down here. So Texas has lots of resources that you'll cover in the next few months. Surface water, groundwater, coal, oil, gas, caves. This is from Matthewson, by the way. So now we he was trying to make a point that Texas is rich in a lot of things. So we have a lot of water resources. We have a lot of aquifers. We're gonna talk about the Ogallala and how that's getting pumped dry. Uh, we can talk about oil production. We're not gonna talk about blowouts and stuff. Caves, I remember Texas was underwater for millions of years. And so we have a lot of limestone caverns all across the state. They get hollowed out just like any other cave. And so we have stuff like that that shows up. Stalactites and stalagmites and underground systems, inner space cavern. I've never been to any caves in Texas, to be honest with you. I grew up in West Tennessee and Arkansas and spent a lot of time in Mammoth Cave and Carl, been to Carlsbad once. So anyway, that's the end of the presentation. So we're gonna get, it's 9.45. I think we're about right on schedule. I'm okay. going to- we have some some comments and some questions, Scott. Uh, no questions are allowed if they're hard. So that's okay. the criteria that I've got. <laughs> well, I tell you what, that the thing about the San Antonio River and having that um, that tunnel that goes under San Antonio, it was amazing. Someone else mentioned that they had, they were surprised by that, and I think that's pretty awesome. So let's see if I can find some of that. Yeah, there was, a, there was actually a really uh, interesting article in the Chronicle after Hurricane Harvey about how we missed the opportunity. It, it was by the guy that used to run uh, the water district. I got to stop sharing here. Hang on. Okay. Let's oh. see. Oh, new, I see. New share. I see your, I can see your screen and that is fine. I'm just trying to stop sharing. Oh. Basic advanced whiteboard. Right. It should be at the very top of your screen. It should say stop sharing. Do you see it? Nope. You are screen. Oh, there it is. Found it. There you go. Awesome. Uh, now I can now I can see everybody. There, yes. Now you see. can see everybody. And uh, Steve Ellison sent me a message and said, outstanding presentation. And this is after he accused me of this being the most boring chapter he had ever read. So, <laughs> See that? He just needed to have somebody read it to him. That's why it is. Yeah. Have, and just to tell everybody, just it's very difficult to cover. Like the textbook covers an incredible amount of detail stuff. Mm -hmm. The goal here was just to try to relate it to what we really like, which is the Hartwood chapter in conservation. And so I don't think anybody thinks geology is a central topic, but it's certainly an auxiliary topic that can connect to things that you see like preserving a wetland or why is the soil like it is here? And John's going to talk about that in just a minute. So yes. You said yes. questions, Carolyn. Anything else? Um, let's see. Um, we had um, someone mentioned that the Pompeii exhibit is at the Houston Museum of Natural Science right now. So um, if anyone wants to go and explore more about what force volcanoes have in our existence, that's one place to go. Um, someone said that, let's see, water was diverted into the lake, making it an interesting study of how saltwater fish behaved in sudden change in water salinity. Bala, which lake were you talking about? Was that like Pontchartrain? Yeah, it was the Pontchartrain on Mississippi. The recent flood, I think two years ago, they diverted, so it was a reverse flow into the, the lake. Okay. So it was interesting. Yeah. So um, let's see. Bala also said that he thinks that they're um, helping to maintain the wetlands by allowing water to flow into the Chafalaya Basin as needed. 
that no, there's lots of lots of work on trying to preserve the Chafla Basin. It's very similar to the effort. The Everglades is dying just like the Chafla Basin is dying. And yes. Chafla Basin is rich in oil and gas. And so there's been a huge political fight for people to go roll and muck it up uh, instead of doing the preservation part. So if we all like crawfish etouffee, you better care about preserving that system. And it's, it's actually one of the richest. I mean, Carolyn grew up in that area. Oh, yeah. One of the richest, most beautiful places you'll ever see. So, it really yeah. is beautiful. And it, it, I was just talking to John about what it must have been like before they started harvesting all those massive cypress trees through the air. Oh, um, yeah, it's just it's tragic. To just, yeah, to try to imagine what that must have been like way back when, that had to have been gorgeous. Yeah, um, Carolyn, what I was going to suggest is that it, at 945, I was going to let Mike McGee and Bobby Langland be our volunteer voices for okay. And then we can turn it over. We can take a five minute break and then turn it over to John while he gets set up. Oh, that sounds great. So yeah. keep on schedule. So if we can, what I was going to do is go ahead and make Mike the co-host right now. And he can talk about what he does. Mike, is, Mike and Bobby both are on our training committee. And I asked them to, like last week, to give examples to the group on what we like, uh, what they like to do to volunteer. So awesome. everybody different ideas. So uh, if okay with everyone, I'm going to make Mike a co-host. Mike, you're a co-host. And you can share your screen or do whatever you want. And then after that, we'll turn it over to Mr. Bobby. Yeah, I don't have anything prepared other than I jotted a few notes. Um, I've been a master naturalist for five years. Um, a lot of my and the majority of my volunteering is at Mercer Arboretum, and you will hear a great deal about that uh, from Anita Tiller um, during her section on botany. But I'll give you a little bit of the details of, of volunteering there. The, <clears throat> they're organized into committees, and I volunteer with the Natives Committee. Um, we propagate native plants that we sell to the public. Uh, into major sales a year. Um, during COVID, we've started doing virtual sales and we've had six or seven of those in the last year. And those have proven to be um, quite effective. Um, so volunteering there, we propagate um, between three and 4,000 plants a year uh, that are natives. Um, those are either from seed or in some cases, uh, the volunteers who have gardens like myself uh, bring in seedlings and we uh, pop those up and grow them uh, basically for sale. So um, it's a great place to volunteer. Uh, you learn a lot from each other. Um, everybody's plant enthusiasts there, several master naturalists and uh, master gardeners or members of the Native Plant Society. So we learn from each other and just a very wide ranging conversation. It's a good uh, little group little group, rel uh, relatively little group. Uh, we typically have uh, six or eight people uh, there, sometimes as few as four. And there's probably uh, a dozen or so active members of the native group um, at Mercer. So it's a um, great place to volunteer. There's also a lot of other uh, opportunities there at the herbarium you'll hear. Later on, uh, they also have uh, um, a native preserve of about three and a half acres, and there's opportunities to uh, aid that either in counting or in maintenance activities. I've done a little bit of that. Um, I also do volunteering for my community, uh, and some of that is master naturalist related either in uh, sub, um, authoring articles we put in community newsletter on trees or the benefits of native plants or um, I've designed and then uh, organized some uh, sustainable um, native um, gardening projects in our native in our neighborhood. So um, that's kind of my story on where I do most of my volunteering as a master naturalist. So Bobby, I guess over to you, unless somebody has any questions. Okay, well, no, I, I hear you, Mike. Um, there you go. 
Okay. So, yeah. So I guess, um, I guess from my, I guess most of the people probably in the intern class have heard from me or at least gotten an email from me. So um, I guess from my journey here is, you know, number one, I, I just retired here recently. So I'm, I'm working my way into, um, you know, finding different activities to volunteer and help, help in. And kind of being new on this journey, um, I, I'm in the help mode, right? It, it was like, okay, well, you know, where, where do we need help? And, and let me go help them. And I guess fortunately, or unfortunately, um, my wife, Carolyn, uh, just happens to be the president of the Heartwood chapter. So um, for me, it's been very easy to see, you know, where help is needed. And as you can see, I, I wanted to be a mentor for all of this uh, intern class. Um, so I've, I've probably bugged y'all enough. Same thing this morning, I, I watched attendance and anyone not in attendance, I contacted them. Um, a few of them had you know, notified Scott that they were gonna miss today's class, but a couple of others um, you know, had not notified us, but you know, told me about it today. So, so that's kind of where my help's been. I, I also um, you know, did some volunteer work for Mercer, um, kind of same as Mike. I was more in kind of the office arena um, when they collect all of the, you know, plant species and, um, you know, put them on that paper for archive. Um, they're now trying to go digital with that. And so I, I helped, uh, they bought a nice fancy camera and I worked with, uh, you know, finding the best way to get the camera set up and wrote the instructions for any future person that would come and volunteer and want to take pictures. Uh, I kind of gave them the, uh, had everything a nice easy checklist for them to do so and probably then you know the next way I think of going is you know there's a lot of committees that have been formed that are are um, you know helping on our journey and so I was going to check with the committee leaders there and just see you know what help they may need but again that the thing I found valuable is the uh, newsletter and uh, the bulletin it pretty much uh, gives you lots of volunteer choices. So I would just recommend going there first. That's all I had, uh, Scott. All right, uh, so I'm gonna put myself back on video. We've all been at it. It is 9.56 according to me. Let's just call it 10 o'clock. At 10.10, uh, we're gonna turn it over to Mr. John Ferguson, the esteemed John Ferguson, who you've heard on garden shows and from Nature's Way and does wonderful stuff that uh, he's educated me. He gives a wonderful presentation. I warned you that the soils section of the textbook, <clears throat> I find not terribly interesting. John's gonna make soil interesting. So I'm gonna say 1010, all y'all fill your coffee cups up, go take a bathroom break and I'm gonna go grab myself and John a coffee. And if I don't get back in time, Carolyn and John will kick off at 1010 with soils, okay? John, uh, Bobby and Mike, thanks for giving us a heads up and I'll see you guys in 10 minutes. Ready for John and Scott, you want to come introduce John? Give everyone his a little bit of info. I'll only say briefly, most of you all, this is an amazing thing, baseball caps. I've gone for years. I've been to meetings where I never take this off and nobody knew I didn't have it here. So <clears throat> interesting true fact. <laughs> exactly. So you, you, you appreciate the value of hair when you get sunburned. Mm -hmm. So you wear, it, you wear it constantly and I wear it constantly. And so it's affixed to my head. So long story short, uh, I first met John when our, the previous training director, Terry MacArthur, who you will meet if you haven't met already. She's a founder of Hartwood and a very famous person. <clears throat> also on the training committee, luckily. I had, she had John do a presentation on soils that I've seen twice now. And so I, I don't think he needs too much introduction. I'll let him go ahead and take over. But 
uh, listen closely, you're gonna learn a lot. So take all those nice geology principles that we covered and think of weathering and all the processes you do to get there to the sediments you see. And now think about what we're gonna do with the wonder of soils. Let me turn it over to John. All right, thank you, Scott. Okay, get everything up here. Whoops, that's good. Well, I didn't even know it was titled The Wonders of Soil. That's yep. quite a good reason. So anyway, we're gonna talk about soil. Soil is a branch of geology. It's one of my passions since I'm a licensed soil scientist. So let me make sure I'm getting everything work here. I'd like to start off with this little cartoon. What is the difference between dirt and soil? Have you ever thought about it? Well, well, if we look at soil, the physical aspects of soil, it's sand, silt, and clay. They're basically silicate minerals, you know, like quartz, hard, but they have different sizes, but it's dirt. Oh. We're gonna, we're gonna go back, uh, let's do escape. Let's go here. Let's do share screen. Just dirt. Share. Now we're going to go to full screen. All right. Do we want to go? There we can go. Every, can, can everybody see the screen now? Yes, I can definitely see that. All right. Sorry about that. That's okay. Start we'll start over. over. All right. There we go. Okay. Never had to do this before. Anyway, I'm a soil scientist. I'm a soil science nut. So let's go from there. And we're going to pick up because soil science is a branch of geology. So I'd like to start with this slide called, is it soil or dirt? What is the difference? Have you ever thought about that? Well, one of the things we look at the physical attributes of soil soil texture, it's sand, silt, and clay. They're silicate minerals, kind of like quartz, at, when you make it down small enough. But it's not soil. It doesn't become soil. This is just dirt. It doesn't become soil till we add organic matter and life. Soils are alive. If we went out into the forest here and we dug up a handful of soil, there's six trillion microbes in it. Soil is alive. It's a very complex living organism. So if we look at soil, you can see there's all these different interactions. I mean, nutrients are being exchanged, uh, oxygen, gas exchange, water exchange, good microbes are eating bad microbes, fungus is growing. It's a very active dynamic system. So how do we start describing soil? How do we talk about it? Well, one of the ways is using this chart that soil scientists, geologists use. It's just kind of, we call it the soil triangle. On one axis, you says, how much clay do you have in a soil, silt, sand? And so if you if you got a, some silt there and some clay, then maybe it's a silt loam or whatever. So you can kind of start describing the soil types you have. And this chart's in your textbook. Well, Soil science is we've broken soils down into 12 major types. And these, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it because they're in your textbook, but each certain one has certain things. Some soils, clay soils, will swell and shrink. Other clay soils don't. So each have unique characteristics. And so as we gain information, we can start defining these things. But to give you an example, a soil from a beach sand that was formerly beach. Look how beautiful the crystals are in it. You can see down the lower right, you can see some kind of life form. Yo, well, decades ago now, like when I was in college, one of my graduate courses, I had to take sand samples starting down at the Mexican border every 50 miles all the way to Louisiana. And by analyzing the soil sample, the sand samples, where did it come from? How far did it travel? What are the minerals in it? What was the source rock? So I had to do some soil forensics. It was a very interesting process, but but it gives you an example of how soils vary. But when usually what we do as naturalists, we're thinking about soils in terms of life, trees, plants, animals, insects. So here kind of gives you a structure. You can see the soil particles on your left and above. Then we got a root. We got a cross section of a root coming in. 
So it's very complex, dynamic living system. Many things talk, taking place. Fungus is growing. Roots are growing. Things are getting eaten. So it's a constant changing. Well, we've learned in modern soil science, we have a process called the soil food web. And there's all kind of life, starting with bacteria, fungus. I remember when I was in grad school, we used to think of in a, just a tablespoon of soil, there were 15, 20 species of bacteria. Now we know there's 25,000. We used to think there were just a couple dozen species of fungus. Now we know it could be three or 4,000 species in a tablespoon. Because most of these things are transparent, so we couldn't see them. It's only for the scanning electron microscope, the DNA mapping techniques, chemical stains to make them absorb, get, turn colors, not be clear, that we've learned so much in the last 20 years about soils. And, and the model we talk about today is called the soil food web. Well, when we get the soil food web working for us, like the bacteria will put out chemicals called polysaccharides or type of sugar, they glue stuff together. Many of the fungus will put out globulins, which is another type of glue. That, and they start creating structure, binding these poles together so they don't erode. And we start creating a crumb structure. We need to grow plants that makes a healthy soil, whether it's a forest or yards and gardens. <clears throat> Both of the smaller pores you see here have water in them, designated by the blue. The large pores have air. Many of the microbes, like amoebas and protozoa, will live in the water films around here, looking for bacteria to eat. So it's a lot. Well, one of the things about healthy soil, a cubic foot of soil is equivalent to about seven and a half gallons. If we can get 50% porosity in our soils, the soil can hold quite a few gallons per cubic foot, which equates to about 150,000 gallons per acre in the first 12 inches. I remember I was at a study group though, right after Hurricane Harvey, that if 20% of the parks and other landscaped areas in Houston had converted to organic or biological management, we would increase in the, the water holding capacity of soil, it would have dropped the floodwaters of Hurricane Harvey about 30%, just 15%. If we did it along the region, we could eliminate floods like from Hurricane Harvey. <clears throat> Here's another way of looking at it. This is from the USDA. Every time we increase 1% organic matter, that's 25,000 gallons of water we can store per acre. So one of the best things we can do is get healthy soils. So I think, to give you a personal example, my yard's been in better homes and gardens. I have not had to water my grass or my flower beds since the drought of 2011. I save thousands of dollars a year on my water bill. So by building the organic matter, if we go back in history, back into the original forest or the Great Plains, they had about 8% organic matter by weight, which is, or 8% by, by weight, which is 25% by volume. Again, another one from the NRCS, just 3% organic matter, 120,000 gallons of water per acre. If we want to solve our water problems, we've got to see solve our soil problems. Well, let's talk about the soil food web. It starts off, all life forms have to have energy. So plants is where it begins. They collect energy from the sun and through photosynthesis, they take carbon from the air and they form long chains of carbon. And when the plants die, the roots turn over or whatever the mechanism, carbon is in the soil and available. And if you think about our fireplace, when we put wood in the fireplace, carbon in the wood is combined with oxygen releasing energy. Well, in the soil, microbes take the carbon from the organic matter, combine it with oxygen, and the exact same amount of energy is given off. So as we have the bacteria, fungus eats the organic matter, the bigger guys, the nematodes, protozoa eat the bacteria, anthropods eat the fungus, birds, animals eat those guys, and eventually mankind. So the energy moves through the system. Well, an example, here's a typical uh, Lake Charles Beaumont black clay, terrible stuff. When we look at clay under a microscope, you can see these sheets or plates. These are silicate minerals. Well, one of the things that microbes can do, certain bacteria will put out an enzyme 
and they can break these plates apart and they kind of glue it around their body to make an armor of quartz to keep them from being eaten. Later on, certain types of fungi will tie these little tiny agar micro aggregates together and start creating the crumb structure we like. So I don't know if I can show it or not, but I'm so used to doing this live, but here's the, where's the, oh, there's the camera. Black gumbo clay, hard as a rock. By using these modern techniques, you can, I don't know if you can see how loose and crumbly it is. You can take black clay, black clay and turn it into a rich loam. But details is for another tip. But you can see how the soil affects things. Well, well here's a bacteria. Bacteria get eaten by protozoa in the soil or eat earthworms or nematodes. And the bacteria doesn't like to get eaten. So how do they protect themselves? Well, one of the ways they put out an enzyme that breaks those clay particles of silicate sheets and they glue it around their body to make an armor of quartz. Our first little piece of particle of soil structure. Then after the biology has been there, you can see how the black clay after a period of years, so putting the right biology breaks it up. What feeds the biology? Compost, native mulches. And that's a whole nother talk on why and how, but organic matter is where it starts with. Here's another picture of microscope. You can see particles of soil, minerals. You can see the fungal hyphae wrapping around them. And you can see how much airspace is actually in the soil. It's in healthy soil, you might have 50% airspace. Sometimes it's filled with air, sometimes with water. But it's very loose. Uh, here's some more pictures. How the bacteria are colonizing and creating biofilms on structure of roots and things. There's just tremendous amounts of life. So make it simpler, here's a diagram. When we look at soil, we got the soil particles, the mineral particles, like sand particles. Sand is much, much larger than silt. Silt is much, much larger than clay. So as we look at the slide, you can see clay particles out here. You can see bacteria. You can see the fungal hyphae coming through and some roots. So all this is tied together to make what we call the living soil. Again, here's another example of some fungal hyphae going in the soil. You can see the airspace and the openness. And that's where a lot of these microbes live. Well, I want to mention some mycorrhizal fungus. Well, one of the things the mycorrhizal fungus will do, we've learned about 85 to 90% of all plants on earth live in symbiotic relationships with the mycorrhizal fungi. They're one of the good guys. And as you can see from the upper slide, you can see the hairs coming off of it. And this fungus produces a chemical called glomulins that glues the mineral portion of soil to it. And the lower portion, you can see how that fungal hyphae is totally covered by soil particles. They help, again, they help create that structure. They stop erosion. And also mycorrhizal can create, due to a lot of things, one of the things they can create acidic conditions at the growing tip. They can be a hundred times more acidic than the soil in general. So they can dissolve minerals out of these rocks and then transport these minerals over to the plant. In exchange, the plant gives them some you know, carbon from photosynthesis. So it's a complex system. But if we use a fungicide, we kill off these beneficial guys. And another question we want to think about is part of the soil food web in nature. Why does healthy soil always have a, a mulch layer? Well, if we, here's a, it gives you a good example. If you can see it here, a raindrop or drop from irrigation system hitting. You know, based on the size of a raindrop, it picks up a lot of energy. It gets into as it falls and it picks up energy, you know, energy square of the velocity. So it throws soils away, creates erosion. And the impact is like a pile driver going in, it creates a hard pan layer. So if we don't have mulch in our soils, we can't protect it. So, <clears throat> but then the mulch as it breaks down is the food, the energy that starts driving it. <clears throat> and all these things are going to, hopefully I'm going to paint a picture of they all work together. Here's a pine seedling, <clears throat> just a couple days old. You can see the taproot farming, a couple little spurs, the white 
little spots are nitrogen fixing bacteria. All the rest of this is fungus, the mycorrhizal fungi. And again, the, the fungi have powerful chemicals to make go out and collect water and nutrients. And if you study pines are a pioneer species, they're usually growing on poor soils. So by having that fungus present, it's probably increased the root zone a thousand times for the plant to get water and nutrients. <clears throat> so the mycorrhizae are extremely powerful partners in helping healthy soil. Another thing I was reading about a couple years ago, been a lot of research coming out of uh, the University of Washington, that they've discovered a fourth phase of water called the exclusion zone. In, in soil science, we've seen that the, these soft, tiny fungal hyphes that you barely touch them, they'll rip apart. At the same time, they can penetrate concrete or granite. How? Well, one of the discoveries is that the plant somehow sends out a message and they make any dissolved things in the water move away from the surface of the water or the tip. And for a few molecules thick layer, it becomes harder than diamond. And it's because of this hardness that it can actually penetrate you know, granite or concrete, rock. Just a couple of years ago, in fact, less, probably last year, some researchers discovered that bacteria put out chemicals to pull electrons out of rock. Without the electrons, it becomes chemically unbalanced. The bacteria use the electron for energy, that's electricity, but it weakens the rock. And that's another form of erosion and degradation. It's just something we learned in the last couple of years. These are new things we're learning constantly how magical creative soil is. The other thing, the organic matter portion, you know, when branches, limbs, leaves fall on the soil, they start getting that carbon, that's the energy they're feeding the soil. So some of the carbon's water soluble, but is it, some of it only lasts for a couple of years. But as it's eaten and processed by different layers of this food web, they form very long carbon chains. Some of them are stable even to five, you know, thousands of years. So there's different types. That's what we call the humus complex. Uh, it's composed of humic acid, fulmic acid, humans, uh, omic acid, different things. But this helps soil be healthy, hold nutrients, hold water. Like humus can hold 15 times its weight in water. So as we build the organic matter, when it rains, instead of running off, creating erosion, it soaks in as held. So soil does a lot of things. You know, there it is. All the different ingredients in humus. Humus also holds the cations in soil, the, what we call the nutrients, the calcium, magnesium, the anions, the sulfur, and other things. And that's why a lot of gardeners call good compost black gold, because it'll have over 300 pounds of humus or humates in a yard of compost. So it's one of the biggest things we can do to get a living soil, to so get the organic matter up. Well, here's an example of a humus particle. And you can see from the little diagram, because of the electrical charge on the humus, elements needed for plant growth, calcium, magnesium, manganese, iron, potassium, phosphorus, are all held onto the humus particle. So when we put down a rock dust or a organic fertilizer, it keeps all these nutrients from leaching out of the soil to plants need them. So it's held there. Then when the plants need it, they'll send a message to the fungi and the fungi will put out a, a message and rip one off the humus particle, and take it back to the, to the plant. It's kind of a symbiotic relationship. So, and I have a different talk on just on the soil food before I go into more detail, but it's all part of this living thing. Also, a lot of rock dust can do the same things. Clay minerals particularly can help with this, store nutrients in the soil. Uh, there we go. So let's get back to the soil food web. On our left, again, the carbon here, they get eaten by bacteria, fungi, and so forth. Well, what happens? The energy that was captured from the sun, this carbon, gets flows through the system. Each one eats the layer before it. It just flows through the system. 
If we want to have a healthy ecosystem, we got to have that energy. So, well, when we get all this going, here's another diagram that kind of shows the space, the airspace, the bacteria, the mites and things. This is soil structure. You know, the healthier we get our soil, the more microbes, the less problems we have as gardeners, the healthier ecosystem, the more nutrient rich our plants are, our foods are. So it's critical. Well, here's a particular, if anyone's ever gone out into the forest, picked up a handful of soil and smelt it, it has that rich earthy odor. Most of that comes from a species, a family of soil bacteria called the actinomycetes. And here's some pictures of it. Basically, they're bacteria that form chain farming bacteria. If anybody's ever had a, say, a St. Augustine lawn and you get brown patch, it means you don't have this guy. This guy eats the pathogenic fungus, the Rhizotonia solani, we call brown patch, or take all, or St. Augustine decline. If you got this guy in the soil, you'd never get those diseases. What kills this guy? Artificial fertilizers, they're salts. Why do we put salts in the canned goods, potted meat, jerky? Because salts preserve it by killing microbes. Well, all chemical fertilizers, artificial fertilizers, are salts. So they kill off the beneficials. <clears throat> well, then you get a disease. You know, the chemical companies make 30% profit on the fertilizer. Gee, Mrs. Brown, you got a brown patch. Oh, you need some fungus next, hair chlor or something. We got a 3,000% profit margin there. That kills off all your good fungi in the soil, which fungi break down thatch. They've created a thatch problem. Now, when summer gets here, you get webworms or chinch bugs. Gee, Mrs. Jones, you need diazinon, durus, man. Again, those patents expire. We got tremendous profit margins there. They kill your earthworms. Earthworms eat reed seeds. Earthworms aerate the soil. Anyway, all started because we didn't take care of one little old bacteria. Where does this guy come from? A good quality native mulch or a good quality compost is full of it. Well, you just heard me mention earthworms, sometimes called a gardener's best friend. In healthy soil, earthworms can dig 250 miles of tunnel per acre per week. So in their bodies, they can store a lot of things. Earthworms put out oxids. They're the most powerful plant growth stimulant known man mankind or a hormone. Uh, earthworms disperse, disperse and move around a lot of the mycorrhizae, the spores of the mycorrhizae and other bacteria and stuff. Earthworms clean the soil. Human pathogens like Salmonella, E. coli, cholera, if they even touch the skin of an earthworm, they die instantly. So one of the roles of earthworms in nature is an animal manure and stuff that might harbor pathogens as they eat it, they kill all those pathogens and return the nutrients to the soil. So they do a lot of things for us. And by the way, artificial fertilizers kill earthworms. I love to fish, and when I was a boy, I'd get some of my dad's triple 13, take a cup, throw it in the wash tub, stir it in, dissolve it, pour it on the ground. All the earthworms would come right, running out of the ground, pick them up, rinse them off before they died. And in about two minutes, I had a couple hundred earthworms to go fishing with. So, trivia. Well, other things we're learning, <clears throat> like this rich soil layer, this life layer of what the soil food web, it's usually in the top 10 to 12 inches of life where the plants are. But we have to have poor soil for air to get exchanged for the carbon dioxide from the respiration to escape and let oxygen back into the soil. But it all begins by having that soil structure. Also, when plants, when you have this, like turf grass, can use 50% less water, particularly in the summertime, the dead days, dog days of summer, when the wind's cool, the soil's warm from the night before, carbon dioxide is lifting. Usually in the summer, there's very little wind in the morning. So the carbon dioxide levels builds up in that green area where the plants are, the grass. And if we have twice the level of carbon dioxide there, when the sun comes up, the stomata only stays half, half, but half as long and you've cut your water requirements 50%. That's a simple little thing, how this biological activity helps our soil. You heard me mention glomalin earlier. You can see the white areas of soil particles you can see some root hairs and fungus in the dark area is the glomalin. It's a, it's a type of soil glue, it's a protein that stores iron in the soil. It can have up to 5% iron. And it's just held there till the plants need it. 
Then eventually the plants will put on an enzyme that tells the mycorrhizal fungus, time to bring me some iron. So it brings some iron, goes and breaks it loose. Other things fungi do, like we have too much calcium in the soil in relation to magnesium, some species of fungus will pull that calcium out. They'll form calcium oxalate crystals on their hyphae and bring the available calcium magnesium ratio in the way to have a loose crumbly soil. So we're just now really learning how to work with microbes. A number of years ago, I co-authored a book on organic management with Howard, with Howard Garrett and Dr. Mike Ramaranthus. And this is some research Mike did. This is out in Southern California, very saline soils, very dry, terrible soil. The only difference on this lemon orchard on the left, they didn't put any mycorrhizal at the time of planting the lemon trees on the right. So a dollar's worth of mycorrhizal fungus, look at the difference. You know, three years later, they got trees in production making money for the orchard. It just really illustrates how important mycorrhizal fungus are to grow plants. Another thing we don't think about, but St. Augustine grass will grow for mycorrhizal associations. <clears throat> this is slide from one of my customers. You can see the fungus coming off the root tip, again, expanding that root zone. And one of the things we don't think about is that the origin of St. Augustine, it's originally a higher cross between a prairie grass from Africa that can live on 10, 15 inches of water a year and a Gulf Coast variety. University of Florida has measured St. Augustine roots going down 12 feet. <coughs> so why don't they in our backyards? Salts, lack of oxygen, lack of organic matter. <coughs> so all these things add up to be healthy, but then we got other life forms. How about this guy, the natural rototiller, one of the microanthropods that takes like leaf litter and stuff and shreds it, making more surface area with the bacteria and fungus to release all those nutrients in it back to the plant, let that energy flow. Or this guy, or how about a springtail? We think bullfrogs can jump. This guy can jump 100 times his body length. But notice these antennas, and I'll come back to that. Well, here's one. One of the things we're learning in soil science, a lot of energy from the sun, like the infrared radiation can penetrate inches or even more into the soil. Look at the antennas on this guy. There's a fellow, Dr. Philip Callahan, who's an entomologist. He's now deceased, but did a lot of work 20, 30 years ago and written hundreds of papers about how these life in the soil absorbs the energy and how they're affected by magnetic fields. And he went all over the world and did studies, hundreds and hundreds of studies thousands of locations, and he found that soils had a property of, called paramagnetism, that if the soils are paramagnetic, they had more, more growth, less insect and disease pressure, higher productivity. Never could explain why, but paramagnetism is a property, just like in electricity, we have conductors and insulator. So in magnetism, we have there have things that are magnetic or paramagnetic just a property of matter, but soils that were paramagnetic were much healthier than non-paramagnetic. And one of the things I mentioned later, mineral dust, rock dust, we're now learning those can increase productivity of our forest, our grasslands, our food. Well, most of those, if it's from granite or basalt or paramagnetic. So interesting things to see what science reveals over the next few years. And we got other critters like nematodes, and you see this nematode burrowing into it. This is a root, not nematode. He's burrowing into the walls of the root. So, so how does nature control these pest nematodes? There's about 1,400 species of nematodes. Only 20 are bad guys. The rest are beneficial. Well, how about those good old fungi again? My first experience with this guy was 40 years ago when I was putting a vegetable garden in my backyard raising tomatoes. Come home from work, the tomatoes wilted. And I said, dang, I got a you know, root knot nematode problem. And I was reading a magazine then called Organic Manage. Oops, forgot to mute my phone. Anyway, I was reading the Organic Gardening magazine. There was a letter to the editor there, and this guy was saying he got the same thing, root knot attacking his vegetables. How do you control it? And he said, put a good compost on it. Well, I've been making compost since I was eight years old. So I went out behind the fence and picked up a big whirlbarrow low, put it around my tomatoes, watered it in. 
week later, Ken, no more wilt. Talked to all my friends at SFA and a and and oh, John, you're crazy, there's no proof. I said, I'm a scientist. I had a problem, I did something, the problem goes away. That's a cause and effect relationship. Well, a few years ago, microbiologists learned there's a species of fungus called nematode trapping fungi. And you can see how the fungus comes in and creates a loop. And in that loop, he puts out chemicals that mimic what roots put out called root exudates, bait. So the nematode swims in, the fungus squeezes it shut. So just how soil takes care of itself and protects itself. Nature is an amazing thing if we learn to study it and learn how to work with it. But if you use the, the pesticide you'll, or a fungicide, you'll kill off this good fungus and it sets you up for a nematode problem. And by looking at nematodes, they have different mouth types. Like here's one that likes to eat bacteria. He goes in, finds a bacteria, eats it, releases the nutrients in it, the nitrogen and other minerals and elements in the bacteria's body. Then we got the mites and stuff, the water bears. So we got those. Cute little fella. He sucks the ghost, finds algae, that little mouth part, and sucks the juices out. So. Here's a picture of algae. We've learned so much in the last few years that algae can fix nitrogen. If and only if the trace element molybdenum is in the soil. If we don't have molybdenum, we don't have algae, or at least out nitrogen fixing algae. Again, they capture sunlight there and they pay carbon. So lots of things. There's a lot of research being done on algae to increase the fertility of fields. So other things like the old pill bug, you know, I was taught, oh, these are nasty pests, you need some diazinon or durazban or something to get rid of. But pill bugs prefer to eat decaying organic matter or life in the soil. They only eat organic matter when they don't have the right type of food. But they do a lot of things. One of the things we learned just less than two years ago, that if pill bugs, as they eat soil to try to get the microbes of the organic matter, say if there's some heavy metals like chromium or something, they will change it from the toxic form into the harmless form. Same thing on arsenic. They'll take it from a, a form that harms life, put it to an inert form that doesn't hurt life. So we really don't understand why these things do. And again, look at the antennas. Other things we're learning, so many misconceptions I was taught when I was in college years ago. A lot of those half truths just paid for by the chemical companies. They, by the way, they make the chemical companies make the the tobacco companies look like amateurs and they're false advertising. But here's a golf course, turf only a half inch is mowed to a half inch. Look how long those roots are. And that's what I was going to tell you about the St. Augustine. That I forgot. University of Florida has done studies and St. Augustine has the biological potential to go down 12 feet. So why doesn't it? And there's show you some prairie grasses from the United States where you got roots 15 foot long. So how do we use this? Well, or why doesn't it happen? This is an example here. On the left side, there's a, you see the membrane going through it. On the left side, there's a seed germinating. There's no salt in the water. The roots go right through the membrane. But on the right side, there's salts in the water and you can see how the roots can sense the presence of salt. They turn away, they don't go deep. When we use artificial fertilizers, when we use city water, the chlorine it combines with sodium to form salt, sodium chloride. It keeps our roots from going deep. We create our own problems. So, and because I don't use this, that's why my St. Agustin roots are over three, four feet deep. That's why I never have to water. So, See what else? The other thing we're learning so much is the trace elements, what they do. In nature, probably some of you remember, oh, 40 years ago, National Geographic had an article on cultures around the world where they lived to be 140 years old. Where did those peoples live? It was either at the base of glaciers where the glaciers ground the rock into dust and the water coming out was kind of milky or at the valley beneath the volcano, because all the elements in a volcano, very dangerous place to live. Well, because the soils were so rich, it made them healthy. Well, one of the things, 
whether it's growing for a butterfly or a human or armadillo, most mammals, most life have 79 elements out of the 84 naturally occurring elements. One of the problems we see in society in a lot of our yards and gardens, particularly for doing habitat reconstruction, we've been taught by the ag universities that we only need 16 elements to grow a plant. But if the body has 79 elements, where are they gonna come from if they're not in the soil? Well, I give you a simple example, vitamin B12, it's built around the cobalt atoms. Microbes in the soil will make a molecule of B12, plants as they grow will absorb it into the, into the plant and comes in the food supply. If in 1900, we have 50 parts per billion, the microbes would make one and the corn, peas, spinach, apples, whatever, would pull it out of the ground. What happens after 50 years, we've never put it back. Well, we don't have B12 in our food supply anymore. Well, B B12 regulates the immune system. So is it important? Same thing on animals. So one of the biggest problems over the years, particularly in our yards, gardens, agriculture, we've mined all the trace and micronutrients out of the soil. So we got to put it black. So anyway, so how can we do this? Well, the other thing before I get into that, if we look at agriculture, look at USD records, how the, the minerals in our food supply, and this applies whether it's a persimmon in your backyard or a pawpaw you're raising for zebra swallowtails, host plant. These trace micro, these actually minor trace and micronutrients are important. Phosphorus, selenium, copper, cobalt. As soon as we started tilling, we started, when we till, we destroy the beneficial fungus that nature requires. If you went out in the forest floor and you picked up on the mulch layer, you see all kinds of fungus, some yellow, some white, and these fibers going everywhere. Fungus is essential for healthy landscapes, for healthy ecosystems. But as you can see, when we started tilling, nutrients started dropping. We added artificial fertilizers and it could drop further. We started using introduced pesticides, herbicides, because plants grown on nutrient mineral deficient soil are more prone to disease and pest problems. So instead of fixing the cause, we started treating the symptoms and the nutritional level has plummeted. At the same time, just in, since 1980, we start looking, all the diseases that have been linked to certain elements deficient. Today, 90% of Americans are deficient in magnesium and zinc. And there's two reasons for it. Well, one, there have been numerous, but I've seen a hundred studies now that if we want to have a strong immune system, we got to have zinc and magnesium particularly fighting viruses like COVID. The 90% of the Americans are deficient. Why? Well, if, you, if anybody reads our newsletter, by the way, you can get, you go to the website, nextwayresource.com and sign up for it. I've talked about it many times. The original patent for the herbicide Roundup glyphosate was a pipe descaler. As it went through pipes, it would pull the calcium, magnesium, zinc off the pipe, cleaning the pipe. So if we eat foods that have Roundup on it, which is about everything unless it's organic, and the G GMO foods have the highest level, because that's why they were modified, was to take higher levels of the herbicide, your body can't absorb these essential nutrients. And even last year, we never got into the press, but MIT did a study and found a 99% correlation with glyphosate exposure and COVID. So but it's not profitable, so just to avoid it. So, Nutrients, it, we face so much we're just learning about. And this is an old slide. From 1950 to 1998, we had to go to 26 apples to get the same nutrition one apple had in 1950. Today, it's almost 50 apples. And again, this is for humans, but the same thing applies. If we're going to, you want a healthy ecosystem with animals, whether it's deer or squirrel or quail, we got to have the nutrients out there. I borrowed this chart from the the newsletter Natural News, it just talks about all the things, medical problems that have been treated. And most doctors are not trained in nutrition. I know twice in my life I had doctors wanted to do surgery. And through nutrition, I was able to save multi-thousand dollar surgery. So, and I go more into that in other talks. So we got, but everybody knows about primary nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, maybe iron, calcium, and other stuff. But we don't hear a lot of the micros. 
But to give you another example of how this applies, well, consider the plant dandelion. It's considered a weed, most people. Again, when I was in grad school, it was all about, oh, you got a dandelion, you need a herbicide and nuke it. Nowadays, we ask, why is that weed growing? What's its purpose in nature? Well, dandelion does two things. One being an annual, it has a very deep taproot. And this taproot can go three or four feet deep into the subsoil. When it dies, being an annual, the taproot rots and you now have a channel in air where air and water can enter the soil. So one of its role in nature is to fix compacted soils. The second thing dandelion does, you know, when Scott was talking about geology in the case, calcium is a mineral that, or an element that dissolves in water, calcium carbonate. And that's what's formed the case system. Well, calcium, due to rainwater, leaches out of our topsoil until it goes down to the subsoil where it's stored. Well, one of the roles in nature of dandelions is to go down there, collect those calcium atoms, bring it back up into its leaf tissue, and being an annual, when it dies, the calcium atoms are released back into the topsoil. Once there's the correct amount of calcium in the topsoil, the dandelion seed will not germinate. So in modern soil science, instead of seeing weeds as pests, we're now seeing them as diagnostic tools. And a lot of weeds, purslane, chickweed are extremely nutritious, but that's a whole other thing. So, well, getting back onto the nutrient side, one of the things we did to help people get it back, you know, my wife and I bought some acreage up near LaGrange a few years ago. And the first thing I did was put about 400 pounds per acre of remineralizer on it. It's just a mix of green sand, granite sand, basalt sand. And it's got all the 79 elements because that, in soil science, there's Liebig's law of the minimum that growth and health is regulated by the element and shortest supply. So the first thing I wanted to do was to get in my pastures and stuff was to get the minerals there. Because I know it had been old cotton fields where cotton's a heavy feeder. It's pretty rich. And it's been amazing over the last five years how the native grasses have come back. Dove and quail, nonstop wildfires that didn't used to be there. So there's things we can do. Well, in nature, or our flower beds, or our yards, some of the benefits of trace minerals. And that's probably one of the hottest topics in soil science is that these rock dust or mineral dust, as they break down, they released these elements. And one of the things you gotta be careful when reading advertisements, like there's over a thousand minerals that have calcium, but you get one element. And I'm as guilty as anybody mixing minerals and when I'm really referring to elements because it's easier for people to understand. <clears throat> but in a day we talk about global warming. If we found out if we have basalt sand in the soil, carbon, the microbes fix carbon at four times of the rate. So 400% increase in anything significant. So that's some of the stuff. So some great books on the subject was Teaming of Microbes. It's written for homeowners. It's all about the soil biology and how it works. Teaming of Nutrients, about the nutrients, how they're cycled in the soil. And the third one is called Teaming of Fungi. These are for homeowners. If anybody wants to learn more about it, these are excellent books. And if you want to learn even more, <clears throat> like every study of every civilization in history has failed because they did not take care of their soil and they turned it into dirt by various means. Dr. David Montgomery, a geologist, wrote this book a few years ago. Excellent. So we're learning how, we, how important our soil is, particularly if we're going to save our ecosystems, we're going to save the environment. <clears throat> Another book is called The Hidden Half of Nature by Dr. David Montgomery. Again, the same guy and his wife talking about how the geology, the soil science, the biology all work together. Great book for homeowners. If you're interested in help, this is another great book, How the Soil Will Save Us by Kristen Olson. We're learning so much of life. Everything we do is tied directly to the soil. If we don't take care of the soil, we're not going to have a planet. And just a trivia of all the fungus and other shot there. And if you really like to get a fabulous book, a little more detailed, it's called Mycelium Running. The first the third of the book is about how fungus in nature works. And like some of these fungal patterns are identical to the neural network of our brain. We've learned like up in Oregon that a certain pest is attacking a tree. 
and the tree's kicking on its immune system. 100 miles away or more, 200 miles in one case, they found the same species of tree turned on its immune system almost instantly to start producing chemicals to protect against the pest. What the scientists discovered by DNA mapping, it was one species of fungus. And the fungus acted like a communication device to let the tree, the first tree being attacked to tell the others, turn on your immune system. So the, so the second part of the book is about how fungus works in nature in more detail. And the third part of the book is about the culinary aspects of fungus. So I think I'm about out of time. So maybe some questions or what, Carolyn? So. Okay, we do have a bunch of questions in the chat. We've had people talking about how do I add calcium to my yard? Well, calcium is easy to add to your yard. That remineralizer product, you know, green sand has about eight, nine percent calcium in the right form. Is there a specific product recommended for remineralization? Well, we blend one over nature's way just to mix a green sand. Green sand comes out of the ocean. It has all 79 elements. We mix it with basalt sand and granite sand because they each do different things and boost up some of the minor nutrients. And we just call the combination remineralizer. Oh, that's awesome. 40 pound bags cover 700 square feet once every five, six years. So it's cheap to use. So if uh, y'all haven't had a chance to go up to Nature's Bay Resources, it has a wonderful nursery as well as um, uh, soils and mulches. Um, it's on 1488, well, not actually on 1488. If you cross um, 45 on 1488, heading um, east, uh, 1488 dead ends, you just take a right and you keep going and you will run directly into Nature's Way Resources. So I suggest you all go there. Um, to see all the wonderful things that are going on. I understand from someone that um, I think it was uh, Zero Waste says that you're one of the only places in the area that will actually um, make compost from, uh, I think it's like uh, meat byproducts, not meat byproducts, but um, when people have household waste that includes um, meats and stuff that you can actually, what you have will break it down. Oh yeah, the people, the composting books don't recommend it for backyard work because it tracks raccoons, possums, other things. Mm -hmm. I've had animal clinics bring me a dead horse here in the area. I put it in my piles and 90 days I can't even find bones or teeth. There you go. It actually breaks down very easily and it makes a great feedstock. So what else? Let's see what else we have. We had a lot of people ask where to get rid of their pesticides now that they realize how bad they are. And lots of very helpful people in the chat said that there are places in Houston, are in Harris County and Montgomery County that take care of that. So yes, we most, had those answered. Yeah, most of the counties have a hazardous waste disposal thing. And that's where mm -hmm. they get rid of them. They're considered hazardous waste because of the toxicity. Mm -hmm. Let's see. What else? Oh, somebody wanted to know why their lawn is getting mole crickets. Well, that's usually a symptom of unhealthy soil. A lot okay. of beneficial fungus and bacteria that parasitizes them has been killed off. Actually, about God, 15 years ago now, there was a golf course up in North Houston that had mole crickets. They had every chemical in the book and they couldn't get rid of it. And they were desperate, so I finally convinced them to put down compost on their fairways and the putting greens. They did a spring application, a fall application, third spring. By the end of the third one, all the mole crickets were gone because they got the life back in the soil that parasitized the eggs so they didn't hatch. Oh. So. Well, there is someone who has actually asked the question of you that I asked earlier, John. When are you going to write a book? Well, I've already co-offered one now, Organic Management for the Professional. I've got, like I said, hundreds of pages of notes and stuff on mulches. I want to do one. And the third one, you know, I was telling you earlier, Carolyn, I taught a course on, at my church years, two hours a week for 45 weeks of what the Bible says on environmental issues. So I'd like to put that all into a book. Uh -huh. Running a business and having a new nursery, that keeps me busy. So hopefully my son will take over the business and give me some time to do some of the things as I go into my semi-retirement. 
it's going to be hard for you to retire. You know, no, I won't retire. I'll stay busy, but just doing different things. That's right. So Mary Ramsdower has a, a very specific question. She said that her sweet viburnum has a fungus and it's dying from the bottom up. The nursery recommended that she sprays a fungicide on it at night so it dries on the leaves, but she's concerned that using the fungicide will do more harm than good. What are your yep. thoughts? It will definitely, as it rains or sprinklers, it will wash into the soil and kill off the fungus, the beneficial fungus too. To use an analogy, when we use these broad spectrum fungicides, yeah, they'll knock the problem back, but it's kind of like going to a Texans football game. We've got 85,000 people in the stands, one criminal, let's kill everybody. Oh. So most likely there's something wrong with the soil while the fungus is growing. Something's out of balance. And the thing a lot of people don't think about, you know, as, as consulting, 90% of the time overwatering with city water is one of the biggest problems. Mm -hmm. Is we put chlorine, chloramine, fluoride in the water to kill microbes. The more we water city water, the more life it kills, the more problems we have. Uh -huh. so. That makes sense. I'm, I'm picturing a certain part of my yard and thinking that's what's going on because that's exactly what's happening is, is my, um, my blue mist flower that I think mm -hmm. is gorgeous when it blooms. It'll grow and then right when it starts to bloom, it starts to die from the bottom up. And, and it looks really ratty very, very fast. And um, it just confuses me. And it could be because I'm watering more while it's blooming, thinking that it needs that, so. Yeah, it's very drought tolerant. Like yeah. I, both the blue misfire and the white misfire, the eupatoriums in my yard, I've never watered them in 20 years. Oh my gosh. Yeah, that's my problem. <laughs> that's what I need to that's, think about. Overwatering is the single biggest problem. And the health of souls get the less water you need. Awesome. I mean, we usually get plenty of rainwater for, unless it's some exotic species. Okay, let's see if there's any other questions that we need. Someone wants to know what your hours are on Saturday. Eight to five, Perfect. Monday to Saturday. We're closed on Sunday. Good. Get a Good. discount Good. if they heard John's talk today. Yeah, Actually, if, they're, if they're a master gardener, master naturalist, native plant society, got your membership card, it's 10% discount. Yeah, when they bring their their new ID that says they're a Texas Master Naturalist, because they're talking yep. about coming to pick up their ID on Saturday, and then heading out to you, John. So um, <laughs> sound like a plan to me. <laughs> it is quite the plan. So if they bring their their IDs with them, you get you pick up your IDs. Gotta pick yeah, up hey, your Carolyn. ID. Yeah. Since we, uh, since we're slightly ahead of schedule, why don't you let me? Since we're now asking John as of operating hours, right? Which is not a problem at all. Let me see if I can play one video as a conclusion, and then we'll. Oh, them. Since awesome. we haven't done a video for the class yet, and this is our big experiment, we're 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 experimenting with Zoom too, John. Okay. So it's new to us. So let me. <laughs> well, let's go for it. Let me unplug John's memory stick and see if I can find something real quick. Okay. Even if it's just part of that. Um, I'm going to stop the share. We want to make sure I, that we have enough bandwidth to make this happen. Yeah, it's an experiment. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And while I've got everybody in the class hanging, no matter, oh, I got to close your presentation. While I've got everybody's attention, whatever hours that we entered into the curriculum, that's how many hours that you claim. Take to remove. There we go. All right. All right. <laughs> So that's uh, if we had four hours or whatever, all of the presentations are unpredictable. We've had experiences where they've gone longer, where they've gone shorter. Um, I have a, I have a question, a real quick last question for John. Are soil no, he's still here. While I'm looking around, I want you all to keep going. Okay. Are soil tests through the, um, through the ag sources adequate? No. Okay. So where um, should they get their soil tested, John? Perry Labs has a good one. Logan Labs, Soil and Plant Lab down in Eric, Texas, Soil and Plant Edinburgh. Awesome. There's different ways of doing a soil test. In which methodology you use, you can get a tenfold different in answer. Wow. So one of the things I like, a lot of the better labs, build is, like A&M dissolves everything in hydrochloric acid, strong acid. Plants mm -hmm. live in that. So some of the better labs will also have a very weak acid that mimics the acidity of rainwater. 
which is what plants see. So the strong acid test, kind of like a savings account, gives you your reserves. The rainwater or weak acid test shows what the plant is actually seeing. Oh. Informative test. The other thing we've learned that if you do a biological test, it's probably 15 times more valuable than the chemical test. Mm -hmm. And you can go to like organization www.soilfoodweb.com. Mm -hmm. You get a biological test, how much bacteria, how much fungus, how many protozoa, what the ratios are. And that then it's much easier. If we get the biology healthy, the chemistry tends to correct itself. Mm -hmm. Worry about chemistry first is kind of putting the cart before the horse. So um, a lot of people now are asking what um, what are the can we have a list of those resources for soil testing? So the one that you mentioned just now is www.soilfoodweb.com. That's for biological testing, Dr. Elaine Ingham. She was one of the leading researchers over the last 30 years that really helped develop the soil microbiology and soil food web concept. Awesome. Uh, so that one's excellent for the biological. Logan Labs, Perry Labs, Texas Soil and Plant Lab are three outside laboratories. Their tests are more expensive, but they do a more accurate results. Mm -hmm. What was the third one you said after Perry Labs? Logan. You said Logan, Perry, yeah. and? Texas Soil and Plant Lab down in Edinburgh. Perfect. There we go. Awesome. It's real funny since you brought the subject up, Carolyn. I'm a member of, the, member of the Soil Science Society of America. A number of years ago, I bought the soil testing thing. It's five textbooks, four inches thick. Wow. Soil testing methodologies. And it's crazy. The only way to really know for sure is put the stuff into a plasma, put it through a mass spectrometer, but you're talking a thousand dollar test wow. versus, you know, a hundred dollar tests mm -hmm. versus 10 or 15 for A&M. Yeah. You get what you pay for. That's true. All right. So thank you, John. Certainly. It was excellent. And I think you're right about if we had everybody here, it would be, we could have, I would have brought rocks. <laughs> <laughs> right, we're going to try our experiment. We're going to play one video and then we're going to call it a morning. So let me get it started. And then Carolyn, I'm going to see if I can make this happen. All right. All right, I'm gonna stop real quick because Carolyn, last time we did this, we had to check some box, right? Um, was could that so we that? could get the sound, right? Could you just hear that right now when I started it? I didn't hear anything when you started right. it. So we had to. We had to go into. We had to like go in and check some box. Yeah, let's see if I can figure out, was it in security? I don't think it was security. I think it was something else. Uh, when you share your screen, yes, the person sharing there should be on the toolbar that pops up. There should be a dot dot dot. If you click on it, like the second option put in the bottom should be like share computer sound. That's uh, that's what we did. All right, so hang on, hang on. Okay. Second option, turn on original sound. Does that sound right? No, it should say share sound. Share sound. Share sound. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to share sound. Now, tell me instantly if this is playing. I think this is like 10 minutes. Okay. Are you sharing? You're not sharing the screen that has the video on it. You're sharing a screen that has your files on it. So you oh. need to make sure you're sharing the screen. Um, All right, so stop share. Video. So... The video should pop up with like a green box around it. That's it. I'm gonna go back to share the screen part. Who can share? All participants. Ah, this might work. There's something just highlighted up right there. When you hit share screen, did it pop up um, like a white box and it had all your different tabs in it? 
Yeah, and so now I'm going to hit share. Okay. Can you can you see something? Yes. yes. Now let's see if we got sound. Yes. We have sound. Oh, play away. Fifty years ago, you couldn't hardly walk through this place. Let's see if we can hear this. It was wall to wall brush. There wasn't any grass. There wasn't any water. Nobody wanted it. <laughs> He's the finest dog in the United States of America. <laughs> yeah, in Texas too. <laughs> well, I was born uh, in Ohio, born into poverty. To be honest about it, lived out in the country amongst the uh, Amish people. So I really got my life example set for me by my own mother. That's where my love of the natural world came from. I've never inherited a nickel, but I inherited a love of the natural world and a respect, a respect for it. When I got out of the university, I took a job. I sold vacuum cleaners door to door. I went into the uh, fast food business. I teamed up with a young man, Bill Church, and it was Church's Fried Chicken. And we built that company up to over 1,600 stores and we sold it. And with that capital, I was able to come here and begin my work on Sela, the Hamburger Ranch Preserve. My objective was to take the worst piece of land I could possibly find in the hill country of Texas and begin a process of restoration that would change it back to be one of the best, and that has happened right here by habitat restoration, by working with Mother Nature instead of against her, and that's what we're all about. 46 years ago, not a drop of water. Seven water wells were drilled, 500 foot deep. Not a one produced any water. The top 125 foot of these hills looks like this. Edward Limestone. When the driller drilled all those wells for me, he said, Ben Berger, with one place up here on the top, my bit dropped 40 foot. He said, you've got a cavern under there. It's like an auditorium. The only thing about it was, 46 years ago, it had no water in it. It was dry. It was dry because the water that was coming in was running off as opposed to sinking in. When I came here, all of the little holes and all of that limestone were just as dry as the one I'm holding in my hand. Now what happened? We replaced that condition with this condition in two and a half years. After we began, the first spring came to life. As we continued on, another spring showed up. We got up to where we had 11. Where did water come from? It came out of all of that holes and that perched aquifer like that. That's where it come from. It was stored in the earth and all because of one thing, just one. And I'm telling you, I'm gonna show you the greatest conservation tool ever made and everything I talk about could not have happened without grass. The hill country is just covered with woody species. Primarily, it's uh, cedar. We took out a great portion of it here on the ranch. We were just covered with it. We had no grass. When we took out the cedar and spread native grass seeds and it began to grow, rainfall then percolated into the earth because of the root system of grass going down. 
water percolates in, it fills up your aquifer until the aquifer is full. And when it's full, it has to come out somewhere, and they call that a spring. That spring supplied water for all the nature's critters, plus for all the families that live here, and even sends water downstream to the city of Austin. Now, what does it cost? Our governments and governments all around the world are spending millions and millions of dollars doing all kinds of things, dams and reservoirs and pipelines, and all of this can be done by you and I. We don't have to have government. We can't expect government to do it all anyway. But if we do have some conservation ethics, the results are mind-boggling. Now, do we see that kind of erosion here? I'm telling you, truthfully, I've seen this property and the experiences that people have here change lives. What does Sela mean? Oh, beautiful. Thank you so much. What does Sela mean? When I was younger, and I discovered in the Psalms the word Sela. It means to stop, to pause, to look around you, and reflect on everything you see. To me, that's like Thoreau was to Walden Pond. Gives us a chance to say, what's my duty as a steward of this ranch land? And I believe it's to take care of it and to share it. And if you don't share what you have, you're going to live a lonely life. That is a necessary ingredient for every human being that we need to catch up and live amongst Mother Nature and learn to appreciate her for what she really is. I've given this land to a foundation. It'll go on in perpetuity. It'll never be any different than you see it today. When I leave this world, that's what I want as part of my legacy. I should have known that was Ben Masters who did that. He is uh, awesome. Who was Ben Masters since I don't know. Yeah. Oh, Ben Masters is the one who did the um, <sighs> Unbranded, where he took the horses from, he's actually from A&M, and he took the horses from Mexico and rode them all the way up to, I think, Idaho or Montana. Oh, okay. He also did something called The River and the Wall. I, I think was the name of that documentary. Um, he's good. He was one of our keynote speakers maybe three years ago at the annual meeting. Well, for uh, we successfully, with a little help, played our first video for the class. And so Zoom is a experience every week. Thanks again to John mm -hmm. for helping out today. And um, we will see him again, and hopefully, as he and I were discussing while the video was playing, when we meet face to face, there's usually, there's a lot of iteration, there's a lot of questions, and you can see and talk to people. So hopefully, by the time we get partially through the class, the state guidelines will open up and allow us to actually meet as a class to get to know each other better. We will try to play a video every class session, something like this. There's, a, there's longer ones and shorter ones, but... We I have some others that you might find interesting. So mm -hmm. you if anybody has any questions, now's the time to ask. You can unmute. Hello. Hello, Wade. How are you? Do you have a question? Yeah, I was wondering where do we log on for the hours? Well, that's the VMS, and you need to send Melissa an email at heartwoodmembers at gmail.com. That's your okay. VMS system, and there's call in, uh, intern training hours that you'll be able to log. 
So that's uh, take take the hours. All right. So remember, I warned you. Sometimes these go shorter. Sometimes these go longer. The minimum hours that you put in for today are the hours that are listed on your curriculum. Okay. And as a reminder to everybody, if you have missed a class session, you have to watch the YouTube session and send me a note saying that you have done so, so we can mark your attendance. And then you also get on VMS and log your hours in with VMS and Melissa. Okay. Anybody else have anything? Bye, John. I have a question yeah. real quick. Oop. Who went first? She can go first. I'll wait. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the Master Naturalist, the logo that you use and you can get on the shirts. Do you know if that logo is available to purchase? So like my mother-in-law does embroidery. If I have a shirt that I'd rather have it on that I know fits, am I able to do that? Um, they, there's actually on, hang on just a sec. There's actually a branding, um, let me think about it, a branding manual on the state website, www.txm.org. You can go to their uh, chapter resources section and the branding manual will tell you what you can do with that logo. And um, one of the things that we are going to do is um, you will get, you will receive a shirt that has that logo on it as um, part of your graduation. So uh, yeah. Okay, who else? Okay, it's Dana. Um, hey Dana. My uh, brother, one of my brothers just purchased 150 acres north of Palacios and they want to do what was done. They want to restore the land to original prairies and things. And he, he knows that I'm doing this course. And so he, uh, he was asking where he could access resources uh, as far as like land conservation and restoration of prairies and things like that. Is there a is there a, a site that he can go to or a resource? I, I would actually, I would, here's my opinion, then I'll let Carolyn or anybody else on the call jump in. I would start with your local AgriLife person and mm -hmm. branch out from there to Texas Parks and Wildlife. You have experts. And so you can do all the research you want, get too many blogs and opinions. If you want to see what the guy that did on the video, he worked with the local experts. And so I don't oh. think it was night. I don't think he just went off on his own and invented what he was going to do. They worked with the local uh, environmental biology experts. And I think AgriLife and Parks and Wildlife are the first step. Okay, perfect. I'll, I'll spread that information out to him. Thank you. Anybody else? Can you hear and this me? This is Mala. I have a question. Uh, I may have missed the email where the presentations from last week shared. Yes. Sorry. Are you talking about the, the recording? The was shared, but not the individual presentations. Oh, you mean the but actual PowerPoints? Yeah, the, you mean the actual PowerPoints? Yeah. Uh, yeah, we historically, we haven't done that. If you had some specific thing that you would like, I think PowerPoints are one. Uh, you, as you know, you send on a Google link when there's too big and then we end up put P PDF and so we can send it. Most people are very careful about distribution, but if you have a specific presentation, you'd be interested in just ask and we'll see what we can do. Okay. There's someone else who's trying to, to uh, chime in, but I think her, her sound is down a little. Don't know how to undo that. Yeah, I hear can you. you hear me? Oh, yes. yes. This is Lisa, Lisa. But for, I wanted to find out on the next to last week of our classes, it says intern presentations. What is that? Oh, well, so there's two things. Um, well, let me keep this simple. So historically, uh, when Terry used to run the class, she would look around the class and say, when you get toward the end of this, if anybody would voluntarily like to give a presentation, we do so on the very last day, right before graduation. So we even had an idea this year before everything shut down with the pandemic about forming groups of people, like three or four groups. You come up with a topic and you make a presentation. With all the stuff going on with Zoom, I think all that's pretty challenging. It's hard for you to get to know each other face-to-face -face and see who's got like-minded interest. 
keep in mind that for now, if you would like, let's say that across the next few months, you find something you really like, native plants or Mike McGee, who you just heard within my intern class, and he's also on the training committee now. Mike really likes native plants. Mike volunteers at Mercer and for his, he made an intern presentation. Mm -hmm. At his presentation, he talked about how he redid his yard in urban woodlands and a whole bunch of native plants and changed everything for himself. So that was his interest. I gave a presentation about my near-death experience with the Chinese tallow tree and losing my eyesight. So we'll talk about that another day. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I have exper direct experience from volunteering at Jones Park in Northeast Houston, east of Intercontinental, of getting, removing Chinese tallows and going blind in one eye. So there's things to be careful of, lessons learned. I tell this story because we do master naturalist training also at the Ellis unit at a TDC unit northeast of Huntsville. And they, they like to hear that story because they, uh, they, I'm like the Chinese tallow guy and, oh, I need to worry about that. And so anyway, that's an anecdote. But end of the day, if you'd like to do an interim presentation, just keep in mind it's voluntary. You don't have to do it. Some people are not comfortable getting up in public and doing a presentation. But as we go along, I'll ask if anybody would like to do it. And you have generally four, five, ten people that are interested in doing it. The only criteria is you can never do anything that's not master naturalist conservation related. So political agendas or other type things are not allowed. But if it's something in our curriculum, everything's fair game. Anybody else? Okay, we're good. Let's sign off. Thank you for coming. I hope you got a little bit of uh, things that were interesting today. The eco have one more presentation, I believe, is coming up next. We have, and I we will have one more question. We have one uh -oh. more. Sorry. How do you watch a video from the past? You had another presentation last October, and I wanted to re-see it because I couldn't write down things fast enough. The video from the past? From what October? Was in October. It was on plants. And it was, um, do you remember who and spoke? It was, oh, I have it We've had down. two Where master, natu like two intern classes before this official class started. Oh. That's, I think what you're it was talking October about. 3rd. Oh, October oh 3rd. you're talking about that. Uh, so that was a presentation given by Mike McGee and Lisa Tuck, both on the training committee. Perfect. They will be given their own session on that. So you won't miss a thing. And well, how do you re-see it? You can. Well, yes. I think I do have it. I think I have did it. You they did you record they that? They said they recorded it. I think I oh. did. Hang on just a second. But I don't know that's, that's probably Carolyn doing things that are highly illegal, like recording without <laughs> signed written permission. So That's, you know me, I'm just ready yeah, to but, press Yeah, just, just, just to reassure you, they're going to replay that presentation. You're going to see it again in bigger expanse. So even though you want to go see it, if Carolyn can't find it and send you a link, you're going to see it as part of one of the training sessions this year. Oh, okay, great. I have it. Um, yes. If you go to our website, I will put the link in the, forget, in the chat. Are you? It's txmn.org. Yes, ma'am. Let me see if it lets me. Come on, let me back into the chat. Now it decides. You can't get in that chat. Yes, I can. I'm telling you right now. It says no. Okay, I will tell you what the, what the website is. It's txmn.org slash heartwood. And yes. when you get onto the, our very first homepage, you go to, over to chapter resources. You scroll down to media. You click on media and it brings up all of the PowerPoints and slideshows that we've saved in the past. There's one that um, Clayton Bounds did called the nature around us. There's the Spring Creek Greenway introduction there's climate change, global warming, sources and impacts. And then the fourth one is native plants. 
I got a question for you before you take off. Yes, yes, ma'am. Last week's class, you sent me the uh, Zoom to get back in there to rewatch it. Mm -hmm. I can. My email decided to delete it. Oh, so you need us to send you that link again? Uh, Carolyn, just just let them know about the uh, Heartwood uh, YouTube. Uh, that's that's what I was about to tell them. Thanks, okay. Bobby. Okay, so uh, so Wade and everyone else, the the previous um, anything that we record for the training, I am actually putting on Heartwood's YouTube channel. It's Heartwood TMN, Heartwood Space TMN. If you search YouTube for that, it'll pull up um, videos that we have um, saved for you to watch. All righty. Thank you very much. You are very welcome, Wade. That was a good question. Any more questions before we sign off for the day? It's quiet out there. I think it's time for us to say goodbye. It is. Yeah. So thank you all. I'll, I will uh, talk to you soon. We will be sending out a link for the next training session shortly. And I usually copy all of you and Carolyn and the other training committee members. So everybody's got it. So, all right. Have a good weekend, and thank you all. We'll see you later. Thanks, Scott. Bye.